السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم الله وبياكم أهلا وسهلا وسهلا ومرحبا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين حياكم الله وبياكم أهلا وسهلا my dear brothers and sisters uh, as we do this event today and it's the first time I'm actually streaming outside of Zoom so <laughs> I hope everything goes good inshallah with no hiccups with the Lal Kareem um, can everybody hear me first and foremost before anything please let me know and then we're good to start حياكم الله وبياكم okay so I won't be able to obviously keep an eye on the comments and everything um, So try and keep the comment section clean inshallah And I have one or two brothers that are moderating inshallah Hopefully they manage to keep up Okay, bismillah Okay First thing, let me share my screen Okay you can all see my screen, I hope. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, today's session is titled A Proven Method on How to Acquire Arabic Vocabulary Efficiently and Master Grammar Skills Effortless, 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 Effortlessly. Um, the very first thing I want you to do is to uh, join me on an app called Book Lab, which is an app that we use to keep you engaged and to ask questions. And the likes, there is the link uh, Those of you that have been studying with me know what the app is Just go to the link inshallah And join the event page And when I pose a question you can answer the question inshallah ta'ala طيب. um, Let me just double check that the screen is being shared properly um, Okay, yeah, that looks good Alright, bismillah uh, first and foremost to introduce myself For those of you that uh, don't know me I'm your brother Muhammad bin Abdul Wali And um, I study here at King Saud University um, I've done a bachelor's in Tafsir Alhamdulillah And now I'm doing my master's And uh, I've also been uh, learning Arabic since the age of 14 Albeit by accident But that's a story for another day And Alhamdulillah, I memorized the Quran as well at that age back in the in UK And then Alhamdulillah, I got accepted at King Saud, King Saud University And right now I'm in my master stage And uh, for the past 10 years I've been here in this blessed country Studying with the scholars, most notable of them uh, Sheikh Saleh Al-Fawzan and Sheikh Al Al-Haddadi and others um, In terms of occupation, then I've been teaching Arabic and that's the main thing that I do Other than the Islamic studies Islamic classes that I also conduct Alhamdulillah I've been teaching it since 2012 And I generally have a passion for this language It's a beautiful language It's the language of the Quran Also I've done a training with Arabic for all Who are the authors of Al-Arabi to Baini Daik It was truly a, an eye-opening training really um, And some of the things I'm going to share today Have been taken from a book called Ida'at Which is the book they Um Used for their training as well It's actually available, you can buy it And it's a book It is for those who teach the Arabic language To non-natives So it's a very specific book Written by Sheikh Abdurrahman Al-Fawzan Who is one of the lead uh, instructors And authors of this uh, very blessed series Really, Al-Arabi to Bain Daik And with decades of experience He has um, he has put all of that here in this book uh, Specifically written for who? For those people who teach the Arabic language um, So for those of you that teach Arabic I tell you to, I advise you to go back to this book To inform your instruction Also I've done a, a certification course With one of the leading companies that use AI To deliver uh, courses this was about two years ago Before AI became a hype But that inshallah is a topic for another day Another big project inshallah that uh, You'll come to know of when it's ready inshallah But 
um, enough about me. I want to know a little bit more about you. So if you can go to WooClap and answer uh, a few questions, inshallah. Answer a few questions. Um, first one being, where are you joining us from today? Um, let me share the screen as well so that you guys can see the answers. Obviously, all of the answers that you post are anonymous, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, Bismillah. Okay, mashallah. So we have people joining us from Saudi Arabia, UK, Belgium, the Netherlands, Sweden, San Diego, San Diego in the US, even Australia. Allah Akbar. That's far, mashallah. Arakallahu fikum. Naam. I say welcome to all of you. It's from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has given us access to these sort of uh, tools that we can use to impart knowledge and benefit people. All around the globe Alhamdulillah uh, Another question Is how old are you? Or young? <laughs> just, just to get a feel Of what the audience is um, So we have Mainly it's between the 16 to, 16 to 25 age range um, MashaAllah Tabarakallah Which means there's a lot of khair Alhamdulillah in the ummah A lot of youth MashaAllah uh, interested in learning this blessed language, Allahumma barik, and 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 educating themselves in in their religion, mashallah. So uh, the third question: What brings you here today? I want to know why you are here today. What are you looking for? What are your goals? Why did you join us today? This is important, okay? Because it sets the pace. I want to be sure that um, I meet your needs inshallah and also want to know if today's event uh, its goal has been communicated properly so now most of you said you're here to learn mashallah tabarakallah i welcome you all um learning arabic martial arabic studies understanding the quran alhamdulillah allahumma barik ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban naam so we get the uh, general feel there mashallah um, let's go back then You can continue uh, Putting your answers inshallah But Jazakumullah uh, khair For those of you that have Participated in that And uh, now let's continue With our presentation Tayyip bismillah um, Really Before I start the training I just want to talk quickly about This training What it's about Okay Okay uh, the very first thing is that I'm, and I'm trying to be as concise as possible The time is limited This is one of the most densely packed lectures I've done in my life I'm trying to cover so much in a little bit of time I'm trying to keep it within an hour So I'm going to be very concise The training is basically a summary of my experience in learning and teaching Arabic I want to give all of that to you guys today So that you can use that experience to improve uh, your journey and to get to your goals, inshallah ta'ala, much faster. Tayyip, of course I've got millions of questions coming in from the community and people. Uh, inshallah some of the members of the team will hopefully take care of that. Uh, Tayyip, then we have the why. Now this, I can talk about at length, but I try to be as concise as possible. Number one, of course the reason why I want to deliver this training is because of the importance of learning Arabic, obviously. And this doesn't come... As a surprise to any of you, all of you know the importance of the Arabic language in our religion. Okay, as a matter of fact, your understanding of the Quran and Sunnah depends on it. Your guidance to an extent depends on it. So that goes without saying. Of course, I could spend some time bringing all the different narrations about the ruling of learning Arabic, which Sheikh Salman Taymi holds to be wajib, uh, obligatory, and so on and so forth. But that's not today's topic. Uh, another reason why I'm doing this training is because it it's kind of in line with my goal and vision in life, uh, which I have communicated with many of you many, many times. Uh, and also you'll find in the uh, in the flyer or the message that you got, which is to help the general Muslim to gain access to the Quran and Sunnah without relying on translators so that he can benefit directly from the scholars 
and uh, and so on and so forth. Now, why is this my goal and vision? Again, I'll try and be as concise as possible. Just, it's an answer to these questions, which is why are there so many problems in the Ummah? If we, if we literally work our way backwards, we ask ourselves, why are there so many problems in the Ummah? We find that because most Muslims don't act according to the Quran and Sunnah. That is the answer to this very important question. Uh, there's no ifs, no buts. This is what it is. And many a hadith have mentioned this, that Allah will not rectify our affair until we return back to our religion. Allah says, وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا تَرَقْتُ مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِ And the hadith and the ayat are many. Okay? Uh, mentioned that this ummah, as long as it holds on to the Quran and Sunnah and acts upon it, things will go great. And when it doesn't, then um, things problems will arise among the ummah. So the question is, why do most Muslims fail to act according to the Quran and Sunnah? Then the question, the answer would be, because most Muslims don't have don't understand, don't have a correct understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. They don't understand it correctly. And you can't really act upon something that you don't understand. Okay, so this causes them, unfortunately, to rely on others, on false claimants of knowledge who lead them astray. Okay, uh, because they can't understand the Quran and Sunnah for themselves. And why do most Muslims understand not understand the Quran and Sunnah properly? Because they don't have direct access to those who have proper knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah, which are the scholars. Okay, that is the problem. And then if you answer that question, why do most Muslims not have direct access to those who have proper knowledge of Quran and Sunnah? The answer to that is because they don't understand their language. They don't understand Arabic. That is the divide between most of the Muslims, most of the Ummah and the disseminators of knowledge and the disseminators of guidance with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, we all know that this religion has been preserved by way of the righteous scholars who carry it from generation to generation. However, how can these scholars pass on this knowledge if the vast majority of Muslims don't even understand them? Okay, so these scholars tend to be absent from the minds of most Muslims and their place has been taken by what? By false claimants to knowledge. Okay, so that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, if the scholars are absent, if they die, what do people do? People will take as leaders uh, uh, people that are ignorant. Okay, so the scholars they can be absent by dying, of course, but a scholar that can't be understood for that Muslim is absent as well. There is no difference for a general Muslim that doesn't know the scholars that can't seek knowledge from the scholars if that scholar is alive or dead, because either way he can't access the knowledge of that scholar. And this really is the answer. If you ever wondered. Why ignorant deviants have so many followers in the English world on YouTube and social media and the likes? Then this is your answer. This is your answer because the people are disconnected from the scholars. And the best way to save our youth from their clutches is by connecting them directly to the scholars. And how do we do that? By making sure that they can understand the scholars. Because wallahi, the difference between YouTube personalities and grounded scholars is like night and day. But you will only know that if you actually have access to the scholar. So in short, Barakallahu Feekum, uh, you know the famous Chinese proverb, and this proverb, I love it. It says, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. This is really why I'm giving this training today. Okay? People need knowledge every single day. So we can either try to feed as many people as possible every day by giving durus and translating books and answering questions. Or what we can do is, as students of knowledge and who people who Allah is blessed with understanding the Arabic language, we can spend the effort in teaching everyone how to fish. And in my humble opinion, I believe that if all students of knowledge or most of them spend more effort on teaching people Arabic, just the way they teach them aqeed and fiqh, then I believe, wallahu a'lam, that a lot of the problems would go away. Uh, and we would not be in need of so many translations and so many books being translated because we would achieve what's called a language shift whereby many, many people in the community understand Arabic and when that happens, then mashallah, tabarakallah uh, the language will spread like wildfire barakallah feekum so that's really in a nutshell and there are added benefits um, to this approach which is instead of teaching everything we can just share resources. So what I normally prepare for my classes, 
and I come across it tons of benefits, right? And then I think to myself, how am I going to translate all this and, and share it? Next time when I teach, if most of my students and most of the audience understand Arabic, I can just give them links to the resources so they can access it directly themselves. Likewise, I receive a lot of phone calls of people that are suffering uh, of ignorance, really, because of problems in their household or waswas or the likes, and they seek my consultation. And then really all I do is I go online with the Arabic Allah has given me, I look for the fatwa of Ibn, Ibn Baz Ibn Uthaymin, and I translate the fatwa for them. But if people knew Arabic, they could do that themselves. Wallahi, in this day and age, mashallah, tabarakallah, Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh bin Uthaymin, and other scholars, they have websites full of fatwa. It's just a click away. Okay? Um, so this is really why I'm doing this, barakallah fikum. Okay? Um, طيب. That's when it comes to the Arabic. Uh, teaching you Arabic. But why am I in this particular training focusing on the methodology, proven method, how to learn vocabulary, how to learn grammar? Uh, this is because in order to be successful in seeking knowledge, you have to know the path, how to get to that knowledge. And I'm going to share with you, I want you to listen to this clip by Sheikh Abdul Salam al -Shuayr. He's one of the most prominent scholars of this day and age. Uh, who lives here in Riyadh It's a small clip, it's less than a minute Like in Wallahi, it's golden advice Okay Golden advice, it's the best advice that you can get On the uh, on your path to knowledge I'm going to share that with you inshallah We'll watch it together Barakallah fikum And then um, I'll translate as well live inshallah It's a 46 minute clip Okay It's got subtitles already actually I found it, I don't know who translated it But it's got subtitles And I'll share the link in the community as well inshallah طيب بسم الله إن الإشكال أمرا عدم الاستمرار وعدم معرفة الطريق الصحيح الذي يوصل إلى الهدف. Okay, so the Sheikh mentioned that the problem is that it's twofold. So he was basically asked why is it so difficult to seek knowledge. Uh, that was basically the question. So he said the issue is with is twofold. He mentioned عدم الاستمرار not being consistent and not knowing the path to knowledge. والله the Sheikh hit the nail on the head, Allahumma barik. Okay, let's continue listening to him. إذا وضعت رجلك على الطريق الصحيح واستمريت عليه ستصل ولو كنت أقل ذكاء. The Sheikh says that if you start on the correct path and you're consistent, you will get to your destination. Even if you're not that smart, you will get there. You just need to be what? You need to know how to get to your destination and you need to consistently progress towards your goal. Those are the only two things that you need to gain knowledge. Even if you're busy, even if you're not that smart, as long as you're on the correct path, and you're consistent, and you continue, you will reach. So it's a matter of when, not a matter of if. وليس للعلم طريق واحد بل لها طرق لكن ما هي الطرق الصحيحة؟ The knowledge the Sheikh says does just have one path. It's got multiple paths, There's different ways to gain knowledge. But what are the correct paths? هذه التي انتبه لها إذا قيدا الطريق. This is the thing you need to pay attention to. The correct path to gaining knowledge. الصحيح والاستمرار على العلم. Two things again: the correct path and being consistent. ثق أنك ستصل. ثق ثقة عمياء. We have that. The Sheikh says have confidence. Blind confidence that you will reach your destination. طيب. Now, that is, barakallah fikum, the short version of today's lecture. طيب. This is the short version of today's lecture. Okay? This lecture is about these two things. What's the path to learning Arabic properly? Okay? And how can you gain consistency? We answer these two questions, inshallah, by the end of today's session. Alhamdulillah, today's session was a great success. Taib. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Uh, bismillah. Let's continue, inshallah ta'ala. Let's try and answer th those two questions. May Allah make it easy. Taib. Uh, let me share my screen again. Bismillah. Okay. So... That's when it comes to methodology. There's also one other thing that you need to know, which is 
uh, your ability as well, uh, your capacity, it has an effect. Not if you reach your part, end of the path, but it has an effect on how quickly you reach it. Okay, so there's also an element of learning principles involved. Okay, so uh, there's a particular book that I advise all of you to benefit from. Really, it's called the Learning Brain. Okay, I've got it here actually, and I took a lot of benefits from it as well. Um, it's got a lot of uh, scientifically uh, proven benefits or things to do with uh, how to seek, how to gain, how to basically um, learn. It's all about how to learn, how the brain works, and these sort of things. Okay, so this as well is something that you need to pay attention to, which is that um, Allah Taala has given you this organ, the brain, which is very very complicated, and there are ways to make learning easier. Okay, so there's an excerpt from the book that mentions. Um, over here, let me see if I can just make the image bigger. Okay, so he mentions here on uh, page 17, learning, learning scientists have recently discovered that there is a lot we can do to make our learning more effective. Not only in the classroom, but also in our daily lives. There are also ways to optimize our learning so that we Increase how much we learn So there are ways Okay And I'll share with you Inshallah Some of those ways today So how is today's training Going to happen um, Basically I'm going to give you The information Okay On these Four things And then I'm going to share with you An action plan Here on the strategy Sorry I'm going to share Information about these three things The three necessary Mind shifts that you need to make Four learning principles That help with learning Scientifically backed And seven common mistakes that I have come across from experience that uh, stand in between students and learning Arabic uh, the best way possible. After I give you the information, I'll give you an action plan. Do this, do this, do this. And then after that, I'll also give you the resources. And then finally, I am going to reveal a surprise. You don't want to miss this. Stay till the end. You do not want to miss the surprise. Uh, now, a quick disclaimer. Each one of these points... Wallah, it can be a lecture by itself. Or it could be at least a long-form YouTube video. YouTube video. So, with Allah al-Kareem, I'll create a separate YouTube video, inshallah, for each. If Allah ta'ala gives me the ability in the near future. Okay? But for now, inshallah ta'ala, since you're here on the channel, on YouTube, please subscribe, like, and turn on the notification bell so that when those videos are released, you're the first one to find out. And obviously, of course, it will help with the growth of the channel as well. And that will allow us to reach a bigger audience so that more people can benefit. So don't forget to do that right now, inshallah. Uh, do it now. Okay? <laughs> do it now. Barakallah feekum. Um, khair. So if you guys are ready, we're going to start with the three necessary mindset shifts. We've done already 26 minutes. So I'm going to touch on each point, inshallah. Try and be as concise as possible. Uh, of course, all of the notes and everything will be shared um, in the community. So if you haven't joined the WhatsApp community yet, please join. One of the brothers can post the link to the WhatsApp community. It would be appreciated. Um, let's start. Bismillah. Okay. First thing we're going to start with are the three necessary mindset shifts. Now, these shifts are very important because with these mindsets, if you have them at the moment, it will severely impair you. You will not reach your target with these mindsets. You have to shift to these mind, these uh, growth mindsets, if you like. Some people, they call it growth mindsets or whatever you want to call it. You have to shift to these mindsets which are specific for learning Arabic. Okay? So these are three things, three mindsets that I found that most students, this is what really makes them stuck. The first one is the mindset or the idea that Arabic is difficult. La wallah, learning Arabic is easy And I could do a whole lecture on X amount of ways in which learning Arabic is easier than learning English Hopefully maybe I'll do that sometime in the future But learning Arabic is easy It's not here for me now to explain to you or prove that it's easy I just want you to get rid of this mindset Why do I want you to get rid of this mindset? Okay, I'm going to give you an example I got a reply from a sister May Allah ta'ala preserve her when I invited her to join the Arabic classes, um, this was her reply. 
she said wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh ustaz jazakallahu khairan but i find arabic difficult to master so i will not join may allah reward you abundantly for your effort and kindness allah musta'an okay so this is the email right obviously i've hidden her name and everything but the point is obviously i replied to her and i said to her um, thanks for letting me know I wish I could change your mind Because I don't believe it is difficult To master If one takes the correct approach This was a reply from Almost a year ago This is in line with Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Salam I just mentioned Which is It's all about the correct approach It's not difficult to master If one takes the correct approach and Then I said to her Feel free to share What you struggled with For some free advice She never really got back to me Allah Mustaan But I don't want you To fall into the same trap Please Now Why do you think Or what do you think Caused the sister To come to this conclusion I'd like to uh, Gain your perspective On that Okay So that's a question On WooClap um, Tell me what you think what, co- what do you think Caused the sister To come To the conclusion That learning Arabic Is difficult Marayuk Someone said perception from others Because she didn't get the correct information Incorrect mindset Exaggeration of the difficulty of Arabic Uh, I like this one Where is it, where is it? No, don't go away Multiple fails Yes, I love this answer Multiple fails Okay She may be lazy No, absolutely not No I don't think that's the case at all And I'll prove to you why I'll tell you why It wasn't because others told her all the likes Okay Let me share with you why uh, Bismillah Sorry I'm doing this new <laughs> I prefer Zoom But <laughs> I, mean, I didn't figure out yet How to share multiple screens So I have to go back and forth All the time Type. Um, I'll tell you why Number one First thing Is I We can definitely conclude That she at least tried Okay How else would she say what did she say again? She said, I find Arabic difficult to master. So those of you that say that she was lazy, whatever, no. She actually tried. But I think really it is because she had a bad experience. She had a bad experience. For whatever reason it may be. And this ultimately led her to giving up. So the question is, how can students avoid similar bad experiences? What are the consequences of this mindset? If the, if the, if the, what are the consequences if this mindset becomes widespread? Of course, if this mindset becomes widespread, Arabic language will not spread. We will not solve the problem that we mentioned earlier, which is the disconnect between the general Muslims and their scholars. All right, so we don't want this mindset to become widespread. So the question is, how can we prove that mastering Arabic is not difficult? This is basically the answer this is basically the question I'm trying to answer by way of this training and what's to follow the Arabic accelerator program I want to prove that mastering Arabic is not difficult right and I want to show students how to avoid a similar bad experience okay and it starts with this Arabic is not difficult to learn okay so the question is what causes people to think that Arabic is difficult there are many reasons but some of them are number one what's known as the curse of knowledge Which is when you try to learn Arabic from someone who is an expert And who has himself not gone through the struggle of learning the language And he thinks or he expects that you know basic things Which to him seem basic But to you are very difficult So he starts with you from a level much higher Than that is suitable to you Or he overlooks important points and important concepts Thinking that you already know it the best example that I give is what I call the forgotten skills Which is that a lot of people they start learning Arabic But they overlook the core skills that they need to learn Arabic Which are the forgotten skills Such as being able to read the language accurately and fluently Being able to actually write the language or even type it on a keyboard Being able to actually recognize the different sounds The difference between Ain and Hamza Okay uh, and being able to pronounce the different sounds as well Such that he says Qalb for heart And not Kalb Which means dog These are what I call the forgotten skills And a lot of people that learn Arabic They overlook these forgotten skills 
because they're taught by teachers, unfortunately, who are affected by this thing called the curse of knowledge, who think this is so basic, everybody should know it, that they never put any effort into making sure the students, they master these core skills. And then the student right now is given assignments where he needs to type things, but it literally takes him 10 minutes to find a letter on his keyboard, right? And his handwriting is absolutely atrocious. He doesn't even want to give it a try. He doesn't even know how to write. He doesn't even know how to connect the letters. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why they find it difficult. Another reason, maybe, there's also widespread is teaching exceptions before establishing the rules. Again, which kind is connected to the curse of knowledge, which is that the teacher assumes that you got the rule, you've mastered the rule, so now he tells you all the exceptions, which shouldn't be done. Okay, one of the concepts that I find most astonishing, which I would never teach to a beginner, which I'm sure if you've learned any grammar you've learned about, which is Asma'ul Khamsa. Right? Asma'ul Khamsa are five words. They have specific rules in the Arabic language. But what are five words compared to the thousands of words in the language? Now, if you want to quickly mention it, I don't mind. Asma'ul Khamsa are an exception to the rule. They're not the rule itself. The actual rule is Fatha Kasra Dhamma. But the Asma'ul Khamsa are an exception to that rule, if you know what I mean by Asma'ul Khamsa. So I wouldn't teach that to a beginner. Because he has not even understood yet why we put Dhamma on certain words and why we put Fatha, why we put Kasra. So why would I confuse him with Asma'ul Khamsa as an exception to the rule? And then to top it all off, some teachers, they teach you Asma'ul Khamsa and they teach you along with it the five conditions for a noun to be from Asma'ul Khamsa. Subhanallah. There are only five words and he wants you to remember five conditions. This is one of the examples of teaching exceptions to, 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 to beginners before even establishing the rules, which causes the beginner to be confused. He'll be like, wow, what a, what a difficult language this is. That's another issue. Another issue that makes Arabic seem difficult when it isn't is that the student does not experience any quick wins. Okay? Now, students, they need to see tangible real-life results to maintain confidence. Okay? Especially at the beginning stages. And the longer it takes for them to reach a learning milestone, the more likely they are to give up. What do I mean by that? I mean... In their real life, they need to they need to learn about words that are part of their real life so that when they go home or they speak to someone at work, they can actually pick up some of the words whereby they say to themselves, wow, I'm actually starting to understand the language. This gives them confidence, right? So you need to focus on the core, the most important things, so that they can realize quick wins, okay? However, if you don't do that, then what's going to happen is that uh, the student's going to think that he's not progressing when in essence he is progressing um, but you have not facilitated it so sometimes as a teacher you have to artificially kind of make sure you incorporate some quick wins into the student's uh, learning experience these are some of the reasons they're not all of the reasons okay but I'm sure you've come across some of these now one final question before we go on to the next one which is what if Arabic is truly difficult for you can we discount that? Can we say it is not possible that Arabic is difficult for some people? No, it is possible. People are different. And perhaps you require more time and effort than others. Right? But having said that, having said that, okay, this difficulty is a relative difficulty. It's relative to you. It's a bit more difficult for you than it is for others. But that doesn't mean now that learning Arabic is difficult. La, learning Arabic compared to other languages, in my opinion, it's easy. And I know that from experience. Like I told you, I learned Arabic by accident. <laughs> those of you know, know. And those of you that don't, inshallah, you'll get to find out how in the future. But yes. So I just want you to remember three things. Whenever you face some difficulties along the way and you think, wow, I can't do this. I just want you to remember these three things. Write them down on a piece of paper. I'll share them with you as well. And just consider these three things next time. you. Uh, start to drift towards the mindset That Arabic language is difficult Number one You are involved in an act of ibadah Always remember that You are involved in an act of worship So always maintain ikhlas And be certain that none of your efforts Will go to waste Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in Allah, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions لا يضيع أجر المحسنين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not make go to waste the reward of the good doers. 
Whatever good that you do, Allah Ta'ala knows it. So keep this in mind. You are learning the Arabic language for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you will be rewarded for that. Okay? So you are pleasing your Lord. So whatever difficulties come along the path, it is no different from the other difficulties that you face for other acts of ibadah. May it be da'wah, may it be praying at work, may it be whatever. Okay? It's part and parcel of the test of this life. Secondly, learning Arabic is the shortest path to mastering authentic Islamic knowledge. So how can you give up on a path that eases for you a path to Jannah? Even if the path has some difficulty in it. Because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that whoever takes a path to knowledge, Allah makes him, it makes easy for him a path to Jannah. So in essence, by you learning the Arabic language, you're shortening your path to mastering Islamic knowledge, gaining authentic Islamic knowledge from its sources. Okay? So you're making easy for yourself the path that makes it easy for you to go Jannah. So be patient, my dear brother. Be patient, my dear sister. Okay? Thirdly, if you take the right approach and you stay consistent and you don't give up, you will eventually master this language. It is a matter of when, not if. As you've just heard from Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shuair. Thiq tamaman, he said. Thiqatan amya. Have confidence. Blind confidence. Don't doubt it whatsoever. That if you have the right approach and you stay consistent and you don't give up, you'll eventually learn this language. It's a matter of what? When. Not a matter of if you learn it. It's just that some people will learn it in a year. Some will take two. Some will take three. What's the hurry? Like I said, you're an act of ibadah. Alhamdulillah. That's the first mindset. Tayyip. Are we done with that? Ah. Uh-huh. I don't think there's time to ask you guys on WooClap. But you got it, sah? Bye. Mumtaz. Okay. The next point. Barakallahu feekum. The next mindset shift that you need to undertake today is that, and this one, this, this, this is a big one, which is, I'm making too many mistakes. Okay, so a lot of people, they have this mindset. Oh no, I'm making too many mistakes. Why am I making so many mistakes? How can I stop making so many mistakes? Maybe I need to go back to my books. This this lesson is not my level. Okay? I want you to change that mindset too. I'm gaining more learning opportunities. And those of you that have been studying with me for a while, you know what I mean by learning opportunities. But you'll find out if you don't know. Type. Now, let me tell you one thing. When you start practicing and implementing what you've learned, before you actually know it all, huh? then one thing is for sure, you're going to make plenty of mistakes. Which is great. Um, Taz, we need that. Okay? Because, my dear brother, my dear sister, when it comes to learning Arabic, mistakes are welcome. We welcome them with open, with open arms. Tafaddal. We're looking for mistakes. And I want you to remember this. When it comes to religious affairs, I know that acting without sound knowledge is detrimental. Okay, you don't want to like pray salah and make mistakes. Okay, and just pray whichever way you like. You don't want to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the religion with no knowledge. That's religious affairs. But this doesn't apply to learning Arabic. Barakallahu feek. If you say, huwa tadhabu, yes, by mistake, you didn't invent a lie upon Allah and His Messenger. You didn't fall into a sin. It's normal. You're learning. Barakallahu feek. Okay? So I think a lot of brothers and sisters, they have this mentality whereby they think that if they make a mistake, somehow they it is, is, a, is a big problem or a disaster or even a sin. No. When it comes to learning Arabic, that's not the case. Okay? That's one thing. Number two, you all know the famous statement that there are two types of people that never learn. Okay? Ithnani la yata'allaman. Which is that? Which is the ignorant, uh, sorry, the uh, arrogant one and the shy one. Now, have you ever asked yourself why that's the case? Have you ever asked yourself why these two people, why these two types of people, they never learn? Well, they have something in common. The arrogant and the shy. As much as they look, they're way different. They actually have something in common when it comes to learning. Which is that both of them, they don't try. Okay, why don't they try? 
In other words, both of them don't make mistakes because they don't try. The arrogant one thinks to himself, I know it, what's the big deal? So he doesn't actually put himself in a situation whereby he falls into a mistake and learns from it. And the shy one, out of fear of falling into a mistake, also doesn't try. Okay? So if you are holding back from practicing and making mistakes out of fear and shyness, or because you think that it's too easy, then you will never learn. Why will you never learn? Because you will never make a mistake. And if you don't make mistakes, you won't really uh, progress. It's actually one of the ways that learning is defined. If you look at the definition of learning, some uh, scholars, scientists, uh, they define it as what? That learning is acquiring knowledge from experience. Okay? So you go through a certain experience. And if the experience is a success, then whatever you knew before that is reinforced. Okay? So you said, for example, Muhammad Yadhabu, turned out that was the correct answer. You're like, yes. Is reinforced. So next time, you'll get it right again. If it's a mistake, however, if the experience is a failure, then it will be corrected. And your brain will make the correction. Okay? But the point is this. You have to have the experience. You can't learn without experience. You acquire knowledge through experience. That's how you learn. So in other words, if you don't try, you will never learn. I'm going to share this with you. If you understand, you understand, alhamdulillah. But, and I've seen these kind of people. Don't be the guy, or, or the girl for that matter, who's waiting for the right time to start speaking without making mistakes. Whilst expecting to get there without speaking and making mistakes. <laughs> Sounds like a riddle, eh? So don't be the guy who's waiting for the right time to start speaking. So he stops, he doesn't actually speak and... Uh, learn, uh, implement what he learned um, So he's waiting He's waiting for the right time Where he can speak fluently Where he can speak accurately He's like, I'm not ready yet I'm not ready yet And at the same time He expects to reach that level Without actually speaking And making mistakes He thinks somehow The one day will come When when he opens his mouth He's not making any mistakes And people will say MashaAllah, where did you learn the language? La, that doesn't exist the path to learning something is a path full of mistakes. You don't go through those mistakes, you will never learn. And some of you might say that, I know this. I understand you, Stad. A good point. But I don't want to make a fool of myself in public. I'd rather stay ignorant. And the question is, I mean, I don't agree that you look like a fool anyway. You just look like someone who is trying hard and people actually appreciate that. But nevertheless, if that's the case, then my advice to you is, Look for a safe place to practice. It doesn't have to be in public. When I say to you, make mistakes and learn from your mistakes, I don't mean you have to go to the street and speak to the next guy you you see on the street or you have to uh, go online. No. Look for a safe place to practice. So, for example, we have workshops that we do with the uh, with the cohorts. And this one, one of the students had, had said in terms of uh, uh, feedback. So we asked, him, asked all students feedback at the end of the cohort. This is what he had to say. Alhamdulillah, I think for me, these were the things I liked the most. We asked him what you liked the most about this cohort. He mentioned the teachers, uh, generally passionate about the course. And he said the course had a lot of practical work for you to complete. But the point is this. He said, well, the workshops are safe spaces for you to practice without fear. This is what you need. You need a small setting with fellow students that are at your level. Yes, where making a mistake is not a big deal where people expect you to make mistakes. And that's kind of like your staging environment. You know, the way that when you want to put out a product to the real world, you have a staging environment whereby you try different things out. You need to have something like this. Okay? Barakallah So to conclude, you have to seek out these learning opportunities. You have to welcome the struggle. You need these, they're called actual desirable difficulties. That's what it's called. But more on that later, inshallah. But scientists, they call it desirable difficulties. Right. The third mindset, and we're spending most of our time on the mindsets, by the way. The principles and the rest are easy. But it's these mindsets that need a bit of time and a bit of effort to really convince you that you shouldn't see things that way. So let's cover the last mindset, inshallah. And after that, we will progress much faster, inshallah, because I can see that the time is running out. Um, the third one, oh, how many times did I hear this? I don't have enough I don't have enough time. You have to change that mindset too. All I need 
is to be consistent regardless of how much time that I have okay so remember this principle if you are consistent you'll make it even if it takes long we took this from Sheikh Abdul Salam at the beginning remember and I said that this lecture one of the most important objectives is to allow you to be consistent to teach you how to be consistent well the first step to being consistent is knowing the importance of consistency and getting rid of these mindsets that uh, stop you from being consistent if you are consistent, you will make it, even if it takes long. And the only way to transformation is by way of consistency. Now, there are three benefits you get by being consistent, and I'm going to be quick, but there are three benefits. There are more, actually, but I'm going to mention these three. Number one, the more consistent you are, the easier it gets, 100%. Because the friction will slowly erode away. Why? Because you're going to develop a habit. And when you consistently do something, it becomes part of your identity. It becomes a habit. And when something's part of your identity, you don't need the willpower anymore to do it. You know the way that things you're not used to, things that are, you know. For example, let's say praying salah. When all of you started to pray salah. And I assume that alhamdulillah all of you pray salah because it's the second pillar of Islam and the difference between Islam and kufr. Topic for another day. But all of you pray salah. But we all went through the stage whereby it was really difficult. Okay? But right now, Okay, I trust when Allah Ta'ala make us from those You are those who enjoy praying their salah You are those who can't imagine not praying your salah You are those who praying salah is now a habit Okay, where is all the difficulty now? It's gone Because now salah has become part of your identity You've developed a good habit So now being consistent is not just easy Rather it's, it's more difficult not to be consistent Leaving a salah now is more difficult than actually praying salah Alhamdulillah So You start enjoying it You will only get there through consistency The second benefit is that The more consistent you are The faster you progress Now So This is how it works The more consistent you are The better you get at what you do Which means that you progress at a faster rate So to give you an example When it comes to reading Initially you'll struggle of course You're slow you make a lot of mistakes But I tell you this The more consistently you read The better you get at reading Which leads to The more material that you cover Which Makes you more consistent And better More material You have now entered The positive feedback loop Congratulations The positive feedback loop Okay How do you get there? By being consistent And this applies to everything Reading Speaking Salah, you name it, it doesn't matter. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Memorization. Initially, when you're memorizing, it's really difficult. I mean, my personal experience, I was struggling with three lines at the beginning. But then, alhamdulillah, Allah gave me consistency. Then I was doing half a page. Then I was doing one page. Then I was doing two pages a day. Then I was memorizing three pages a day. At the end, I was doing five pages a day with less effort than when I was doing three lines a day. Memorizing five pages was actually easier. To the extent that, alhamdulillah, the first 10 juice took me about a year. But then the last 20 juice took me like six months. I was going at a rate that is four times faster in total. Why? Because of consistency. If I was not consistent, I would never have gained that ability to memorize quickly. Finally, the action, if you're consistent, then the action itself will become more beloved by Allah. So even though that action itself is already beloved by Allah because it's an act of ibadah, it will be even more beloved by Allah. Why? Because the Prophet Muhammad said, أَحَبُّ الْعَمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ That the most beloved actions to Allah are those actions that are consistent, even if they're small in number. And that's when Allah puts barakah in your endeavor. So, to pray four rak'as, let's say, of Qiyamul Layl every night, consistently, is better than praying 11 rak'as two or three times a week. And there's more barakah in that. And Allah loves that more. So again, my dear brothers and sisters, it's not about quantity. It's not about how much time to, do I have. I need four hours a day, three hours a day to learn Arabic. No. It's about what can you be consistent with? Allahumma, may it be 30 minutes, may it be one hour, may it be two hours. The only difference that is going to make the time that you sacrifice, that you give, the only difference it's going to make is how long it will take you to get to your destination, like I said. It will not have an effect on if you will 
get to your destination as long as you are what? Consistent. Type. These are the three necessary mindset shifts. Are we there? Barakallah feekum. Let me ask. On uh, Wukrab. Are you convinced? Did you change your mindset? Okay, answer that question on Wukrab, inshallah. Then we'll go on to the next section of today's training. Okay, so we have Alhamdulillah, yes. Marakallah, you stack Alhamdulillah, yes, 100%. Okay, Alhamdulillah. So remember these things. Yalla, remind us, yalla. What are these three mindset shifts? From Arabic is difficult to Arabic is easy. Okay, that's one. From, um, what was the second one again? Huh? Yalla. Bismillah. What's the second one again, brothers? Sisters? Yalla, tell me in Wuklap. I'm ready for your answers. <laughs> First one, not is not difficult, it's easy. Okay? Someone said they're almost convinced. <laughs> well, that's all I could do. Go back and watch the replay. <laughs> Inshallah, maybe in the future. In the future, okay? All right. The second mindset is Mistakes, X. We don't have things called mistakes. We have what? We have something called learning opportunities. All right? Then the third one is what? It doesn't matter how much time you have. As long as you're consistent, you'll get there. Time. Barakallah fiku. Okay. You still not convinced? That's all I can do. I can All I can do in this session. <laughs> I'll try more, inshallah, in the future. But uh, rewatch the replay, inshallah, and hopefully it will be useful to you. Time. Going on to the next session and the next part. Like I said, four learning principles, seven common mistakes. These are easy, inshallah. I'm going to go through them quickly, touch on them. And I think most of them, most of you already know these four learning principles. And if you don't know them, like I said, inshallah, we'll do a, a, a separate video on each. So what are these four learning principles that are scientifically proven that you should implement in your learning? Number one, a principle called the Pareto Principle also known as the 80-20 rule. The second learning principle is what? That passive learning plus active learning is how you acquire a skill. The third principle is the importance of spaced repetition. And the fourth principle is about something called interleaved practice. Okay. Let's start with the first one, the Pareto principle. The Pareto principle, also known as the 80-20 rule, is a phenom phenomenon, or whatever, uh, phenomenon, <laughs> yeah, that states that roughly 80% of outcomes come from 20% of causes. In other words, 20% of your activities will account for 80% of your results. And this, subhanAllah, has been preserved in almost everything in life. SubhanAllah. 20% yani of your customers will account for 80% of your revenue. 20% of the words of a language account for 80% of frequency. And so on and so forth, right? Uh, so this is a principle that you need to remember. Okay, so to be more effective with less effort, okay, be more effective with less effort by learning how to identify and leverage the 80-20 principle in learning Arabic. That's your goal, basically. Okay, so you can apply this, obviously, to vocabulary acquisition, uh, where you need to remember that 20% of words will make up 80% of what you read or hear. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you on a personal level, I've actually checked this in the Quran. I've checked it myself. Yes, and na'am it stands. That roughly 20% of the words account for 80% of frequency in the Quran. So if you learn 20% of the words, you'll actually understand 80% of the Quran. And I've experienced that on a personal level because when I was learning Arabic, I learned through reading translations. And after I've done 10 juice, I found myself understanding the remaining 20, even though I've never read those surahs. Okay, because the same words keep on coming back. So that's one thing. Um, and same thing when it comes to grammar mastery as well. 
only 20% of rules you will come across in 80% of the sentences. And most people that talk about the 80-20 principle or that, or that make YouTube videos on it when it comes to Arabic or that have these PDFs where they say 20% of the Quran to cover 80%, they overlook this part, which is grammar. They forget about grammar when it comes to this rule. So when they teach you grammar, they still teach you the whole lot. They teach you everything. <laughs> All of Ajrumiya, beginning till end. The tiny rules, the big rules, the ones that are frequent, your Asma'ul Khamsas, they teach you everything. Even though some of it is the 20%. is the remaining 80% that only uh, shows up 20% of the time. So it would be much better if they focused on the 20% of grammar rules that will give you the best results. Alhamdulillah, I've worked on actually trying to isolate this 20% by using the Qur'an, looking at all of the grammar concepts that are in the Qur'an and isolating the 20%. It was a very, 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 very long project. It took me a couple of years. Uh, but inshallah ta'ala will come. Uh, you'll benefit from it inshallah in the coming uh, initiatives, coming courses inshallah ta'ala. Okay? More of that, more, more of that, more about that towards the end of today's lecture. Second one. Passive learning plus active learning gives you a skill. Okay, why do I say this? First, let me explain what we mean by passive learning, active learning. Now, passive learning is basically what gives you what they know as encoding, storage. It's basically when you listen to a lecture, you read a book, and you, write, and you try to remember. So you're learning passively by consuming information, by watching a YouTube video, by reading a book. This is passive. Whereas active learning... So the first one is storage. It goes from the outside to inside. Okay? Through your ear, you hear it, or you see it, it goes to your brain. Your brain stores it. Active learning is retrieval. It's the opposite. This is from your brain to the outside. Right? And it needs work on your part. You need to remember something, you need to recall it, you need to say it, or you need to write it down. This is called retrieval. Now, in order to acquire a skill, you need both. You need passive learning and also active learning. Now the question is, what's the relationship between the two? And which one is more important? I was going to ask on Google Lab, but the time is of the essence. So let me tell you. It's like the relationship between knowledge and action. Okay? You know that? Knowledge. You can't really act without knowledge. Okay? And knowledge is useless without action. Same relationship. So active learning is dependent on passive learning. Well, there. Uh, because you can't really retrie retrieve something you haven't stored yet. Your brain can't retrieve a piece of information that you haven't even come across yet. Okay, so active learning, you can't really do it without doing passive learning before that. And passive learning is useless without active learning. Why is that? Because what's the benefit of having all these vocabulary words and grammar rules stored in your memory if you can't retrieve it when, when needed? So when you actually need it in the exam or in real life situation, you can't retrieve it, you can't remember it. So what's the benefit of having listened to so many lectures, okay, and spent so much time revising it if you're horrible at retrieving the information, okay? So, and then that's why they say, common sense, knowing how to talk about the skill doesn't mean you can do it, right? Someone can talk to you about how to drive a car and can tell you everything that's involved, but if you never drove a car, he's going to crash your car, guaranteed, <laughs> okay? So, uh, that's basically the relationship between active learning and passive learning. So how, what do you do then? What should you do? You start by using passive learning to store the knowledge. So first you listen to the lecture, you read the book, you try to understand, you try to get the bigger picture. But you don't stop there. That's where most people, they stop. They think they've got this bias. And scientists, they talk about it actually. It's called the collector fallacy and other things. It's, they have this bias whereby they think that just because they heard the knowledge, they think they know it. So a lot of people, that's where they stop. But la, don't stop there. You're only halfway. Okay? So what you need to do is you need to go to the next step, which is via active learning, you need to practice retrieving it. And you need to keep on repeating that until it becomes a skill. So you have the information, you read the information, you cover it, you try and remember it. If you remember it, alhamdulillah, you double check if it's good, fine. If you forgot it, you read it again. And then you retrieve it again. That way it's like as if your brain is going back and forth to the piece of information until your brain remembers where it has stored that information. Okay? And Alhamdulillah, this is the best way to revise. I remember, I mean, 
uh, at the beginning of my master's and when I was doing my bachelor's, when I used to revise for exams, that's what I used to do. I used to read the book, okay? And then before the exam, I would summarize it, retrieve it, blank piece of paper, write down everything that I remember, then go back to the book, double check if I forgot something. And then that, what I retrieved is what I would use to uh, revise from eventually uh, just before the exam. Um, so this is basically how you do it. So that the next time you need to employ a skill, the knowledge is there and you know how to get it. Your brain now knows the path, the pathway to that piece of information. Okay. But now the question really is, what's the best method for doing active learning? What's the best method that you can employ? Now, this is actually another concept, which I was going to mention here, but I did say four learning principles. So I kind of embedded this learning principle under this one, which is something we call active recall. Really, really important, which basically is the best way to do active learning. Now, let me ask you a question very, very quickly. On WooClap. What is the least effective revision method in your opinion? Okay, so all of you, when it comes to revising and ready for classes, you you revise. You, ah, what do you think is the biggest waste of time? The least effective revision method. As if you guys know that. Huh. Questions on WooClap. Okay. Reading over and over. Um, <laughs> yes. That is the most useless revision methodology that you can employ. A lot of people, they do that. They read a book and they highlight a few passages, then they read it again and they go back and back, back and forth. It has been scientifically proven that this is the worst way to revise. Okay? That's not how you should do it. So what should you do then? Let me explain. You should basically employ uh, what's called active recall. Okay? So don't rewatch or reread. La. Instead, you need to test yourself by practicing and making sure you get instant feedback. So this is basically what we call the cycle of success, which is test, check, repeat. Test, check, repeat. Okay? So you test yourself. Then when you test yourself, you either get it right or wrong. If it's right, then that is reinforcement. If it's wrong, then... That's remediation. Okay, so according to the feedback. And then you repeat that. The more often you do this, okay, the stronger your memory becomes. So your only goal really is, how can I get as many of these cycles as possible? The more often you do it, the better. Okay? And this is one of the major pain points with textbooks. Okay, because you need the question, but you also need the answer. And most of these textbooks, what do they have? They have exercises, they have questions, but there's no answer. There's no feedback. So you don't really know if you got it right, you got it wrong. Without feedback, you don't really benefit. You don't you don't benefit because there's no experience here. You've answered, but it's an open loop in your mind. It harms you more than anything. Okay? Um, so that's why interactive exercises that give you immediate feedback are very, very important. And this is the main way, the best way to achieve what? Active learning. But now a question. When should we try to retrieve something that we've learned? And how often do we need to do that? Now, the answer to that is in the next point, which is what we call spaced repetition. Which basically is a method of reviewing mater material at systematic intervals. Okay, so instead of reviewing the same thing over and over again on day one, or just doing it just before the exam, no, there has to be a systematic interval. Um, so there's an optimum time to actively recall something, okay? Uh, to make sure that it stays in long-term memory. And that's in according with something we call the forgetting curve. Again, not time to really explain it, but look at this graph over here. So this is the first time the person learns it, remembers the 100%. Within three days, he will completely forget it. Yes, you, well, you've learned three days ago, you forgot it by now. Okay, you can't retrieve it. You haven't completely forgot it, but you just can't retrieve it. You've got about 60% retention. It's actually 0%. It starts from 60%. Okay? Now, what you need to do is, instead of revising it, reviewing it the same day, let it go and review it the following day. Now, look what happens. Do you see this curve? Okay? It's getting less steep. Okay? Now, instead of forgetting it in three days, you'll forget it in seven days. You'll get to 60% in seven days. Now, if you review it again on the third day, look what happens. Huh? 
it becomes less and less steep up until you if you do it for a fourth time then uh, you basically will remember 90% of it this now we can say has now entered into long term memory so look at how you've done it so let's say this person now he has reviewed this particular word four times look how he has spaced them this is what we call spaced repetition he has spaced them out instead of revising all of them on day one if he revised all of them on day one he would still forget it in three days Okay, so that's what you need to do. However, the issue really here is, and this is the challenge, which is, how do you keep track of the words that you've revised yesterday and the ones that need to be reviewed today and those that need to be reviewed after four days? It's impossible to keep track of that by yourself. But alhamdulillah, at this day and age, there are tools that have embedded space repetition algorithms that take care of that. All you need to do is upload whatever you want to learn or implement what you want to learn on the tool and just go through your stack of flashcards and it takes care of the rest. It's been proven to be very, very effective. Final principle is what we call interleaved practice. Interleaved practice. Okay? Very important. Interleaving is basically a learning technique that involves mixing together different topics or forms of practice in order to facilitate learning. So you need to mix things up, basically. So as you try to learn new skills, okay, you need to mix up your practice rather than working on an isolated part of the skill for an extended period of time. So a lot of people, they fall into this mistake. Okay, they say, okay, today I'm going to revise verb conjugation. So they sit down and do verb conjugation for 10 hours. Tomorrow I'm going to revise noun conjugation. Day after I'm going to revise whatever. La, that's not how you should do it. Okay, this is called blocked practice. Okay, now much better than blocked practice is interleaved practice, whereby... You're doing a bit of verb conjugation, a bit of this is all mixed up together. Okay, so why is that more beneficial? Now, it's more beneficial because it's better for your long-term learning. It's better for your long-term learning. And it's also better for real-life situation because in real-life situation, you don't know what you're going to need to use in terms of grammar. Okay, when you're actually speaking to someone, when you're speaking to someone or when you're writing an assignment, are you... Uh, Sticking to one or two concepts at a time No You need to implement everything in one go So the best way to get ready for your real life application Of what you're actually trying to achieve And to get the real life version of that skill You have to also implement that in your practice um, But there's one caveat Which is that Even though it's better for your long term learning It's actually really bad For your short term performance It makes it worse Which means that if you do block practice, you do like 10 words on verb conjugation, by the time you get to the seventh question, you're absolutely killing it, right? And you think, wow, how great, I'm doing amazing, huh? But that's short-term performance. That doesn't mean now that the long-term learning is also benefiting. We're going to talk about that later, which is you have to separate between long-term learning and short-term performance. Short-term performance sometimes is good if, for example, you're cramming for an exam. You want short-term performance. You don't want to do all the different concepts. You just want to do those concepts the teacher is going to test you on. You want short-term performance, go and do that. You're going to take part in a competition. You cram the last two concepts, no problem. But that's not how you should do uh, your practice every day. Okay? So here it mentions that, although, and this is taken from the book, that although the short-term performance of the group, is talking about experiment, by the way, that was, the, that was used to prove this concept, he says that although the short-term performance of the group that used random practice was worse than the other group, the next day, the random practice group, practice group performed much better than the other group. So if your goal is long-term learning rather than short-term performance, random practice is better than block practice. That's the takeaway, basically. So these are four learning principles that you need to employ to the best of your ability to make sure that you make the most of your learning. Okay? Type. Now, question. Narakallahu fikum. Which is, uh, which of these principles do you use and which is most effective from your experience? Because I'm, I'm assuming that some of you, if not a lot of you, or most of you must have heard about some of these principles. If you have any sort of background knowledge of uh, meta learning which is learning how to learn right 
ما رأيكم what do you guys think give me your feedback before we go on to the next section which we'll try and be really quick inshallah طيب flashcards 80-20 principle revision consistently active recall space repetition I gotta start doing space repetition inshallah now now quiz doesn't have that option by the way Quiz that they used to have space repetition, but they got rid of it. Unless they brought it back, Allah alam. But nevertheless, don't worry, inshallah, I got you covered. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my recommendations uh, when we're done with this. Right. Going on to the next section, uh, which is seven common mistakes that you need to avoid. And these mistakes, I'm not going to say to you, they're completely separate from what we've covered so far. Um, they're not really connected to, every, to these seven things. It's a coincidence that we have three plus four. And now we have seven. That's a coincidence. Or that's uh, something that was not intended. But let me talk about those seven common mistakes. Now these mistakes, some of them, they apply to vocabulary and grammar. And some of them are specific to voc vocab or specific to grammar. Okay? I'll tell you, inshallah ta'ala, as we cover each. So the first one is, which applies to both grammar and vocabulary, is approaching grammar practice and vocabulary in the same way. A lot of people, they fall into this mistake. There's a world of difference between grammar, practice, and vocabulary acquisition. Okay? So vocabulary is mainly what's called explicit declarative knowledge. That's what it is, basically. Basically means this information that you're going to store in your brain, which requires rote memorization. Rote memorization basically is you just need to memorize the information repeated many, many times until it's in your long-term memory. Okay? So that's what vocabulary is about. Explicit declarative knowledge. That's what the type of knowledge is called. Okay? And you get it by road memorization. Now, grammar is completely different. Grammar is what's called, they call it implicit procedural memory. It's kind of like, like I've mentioned earlier, like driving a car, for example. Okay? It's implicit, number one. It's not explicit. You can't really, sometimes you do it subconsciously. And it's about procedure. Okay? Um, and this requires what? It requires deliberate practice, not road memorization. It requires something called deliberate practice. We'll talk about all of this later. And then eventually what happens is it becomes a skill. It becomes what? A skill. So this is basically the problem. The problem is that people, they don't know that vocabulary acquisition and grammar mastery are two completely separate things. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is simple. You use space repetition for vocabulary because that's what helps with road memorization. Okay, so do you use space repetition for grammar as well? No, you don't. Instead, for grammar, what you use is adaptive question banks. Okay, why don't you use road memorization for grammar? Because, for example, if I were to say to you that أكلا محمد تفاحة أكلا محمد الاسفاعل is got ضمة تفاحة is مفعول به is got فتحة If I tell you to memorize that sentence Yes, and you memorize that sentence. That doesn't mean now that if you come across another sentence that says, for example, "Kharaja," uh, or for example, "Darab Muhammadun Zaydan," uh, you won't be able to understand that grammatically speaking because you wrote memorized this sentence. Now you're going to think that only "Muhammadun" is fa'il and no other noun can be fa'il. No, that's not the case. This is more about what. It's more about understanding the concept so that you can apply it to everything. It's not about actually remembering this particular word. So for this, you need adaptive question banks. It's like when you're doing math, for example. Imagine you want your child to practice math. And you give him the first question that says 7 minus 4 equals 3. Okay. And then the next question, 7 minus 4 equals 3. Now the fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth, seventh time you're asking the little child. And every time he answers with 3... That's not because he understood the math concept. He just memorized the answer three. Okay? And a lot of people, they make this mistake as well when it comes to learning how to read. When they do their qaida. They get the child to actually memorize the word and now they think the child knows how to read. You open a mushaf for him to read the Quran, he can't read it. Why? Because he's road memorized it. He hasn't actually gained the skill of knowing how to read. So you have to know the difference. In this kind of situation, when it comes to grammar practice, it's the teacher's job to avoid road memorization. For every grammar concept, there should be like 50 different versions of the same question. They all have the same concept, but different words. Okay? Right. That's one problem. 
another problem is isolating vocabulary acquisition from grammar mastery or vice versa. Okay? La. That's a problem. Why? Because vocabulary and grammar are highly dependent on each other. They need each other. Okay? Grammar consists of vocabulary. So when you want to learn grammar, it's all about these vocabulary words that are in the sentence. If there's no vocabulary words in the sentence, you can't really implement grammar. Same thing with vocabulary. If you want to remember a word and its meaning, you have to learn it within context. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to remember it. Okay, that's why you have all these curriculums that have these made-up stories or these made-up dialogues. It's for you to remember that template, which helps you to remember the words as well. Okay, so isolating them causes unnecessary difficulties, like learning vocabulary all by itself and then doing grammar with a different course or all by itself. It causes unnecessary difficulties. So it becomes very difficult, number one, to remember a word if it's not part of a context. If you just have a list of vocabulary words, that are not part of a context, and you just learn that tufah means apple, qitta means cat, and you try to memorize that, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle a lot. And this, again, has to do with how our brain works, but that's outside the scope of today's class. Likewise, and this is even more important, which is that your grammar practice becomes impossible if it's not aligned with your vocabulary bank. And unfortunately, a lot of grammar books, they make this mistake, okay? Which is that, they got a lot of grammar exercises, which is nice and great, but the vocabulary is completely random. So now you have the student actually struggling with the question, not because he doesn't know the grammar rule, it's because he doesn't know what these words mean. Wadah. So your grammar practice has to be aligned with the vocabulary that you know so far. Okay? So that's the solution, basically. Learn vocabulary by always including a sample sentence. Don't just learn it in isolation. And also, build a small vocabulary bank before learning grammar. And make sure that the practice questions stay in line with that vocabulary bank and it grows accordingly. The more vocab that you learn, the more is incorporated into your grammar practice sessions. طيب. Thirdly, judging long-term learning according to short-term performance. A lot of people, they fall into this problem. And this is such a... I wouldn't say complicated problem. There's so much to be said about this. Uh, but let me try and give you the gist of it. This again is something from some scientists. Um, this is long message. I've shared actually with my students before. I shared it with you guys as well. A quote by some scientists, the Bjorks, right? And to give you the gist of it, basically, it mentions that one of the problems is that the amount of storage strength you gain from practice is inversely correlated with the current retrieval strength. Okay, sounds a bit complicated. In other words, the harder you have to work to get the right answer, the more the answer is sealed in memory. This is what we called earlier desirable difficulty. Right? You want to sacrifice short-term performance for long-term learning. Don't just do exercises that are easy, like using apps like Duolingo. or These guys actually, they mention... Rosetta Stone in particular, they say here that uh, the most popular learning system sold today, for instance, foreign language softwares like Rosetta Stone or Duolingo if you like, cheerfully defy every one of the psychologist warnings. Why? Because what they do is they make the exercise as easy as possible. So people keep on coming back for more. And they say that, oh, look at the reviews. Everybody loves it. It mentions here that the sole problem here from the psychologist's perspective is that the user's sense of achievement is exactly what we should distrust the most. Okay? So the last thing that we should trust when it comes to knowing if the student is progressing or not is how the student feels about it. Because the student, again, he's looking at his short-term performance. The student thinks that, oh, I'm, I'm getting good at this. And now he thinks that he's learning. And if, he's, if he sees difficulties, he's gonna, he thinks he's not learning. And we talked about this earlier. Which is, it's not difficult Arabic, but, you know, you need to struggle in order to gain. So, it mentions here that precisely those things that seem to signal we're learning well, such as easy performance on drills, fluency during a lesson, because the teacher has made it easy, or even the subjective feeling that we know something, are misleading when it comes to predicting whether we will learn, or whether we will remember it in the future. So just remember this. Your short-term performance is not an indication of your long-term learning. Rather, the more the teacher pushes you, of course, not beyond a limit where you can't. And this is where the, this is a teacher's job, to make sure that 
he constantly pushes your limits. If he makes it too easy, you're going to disengage. If he makes it too difficult, you're going to give up. So it's about finding the balance. Okay? So the solution is that you change your mindset, okay, to a mindset that distinguishes between long-term learning and short-term performance. Like I said, there are times when you want to have short-term performance, like before an exam or a test. Okay? But you need to know that these two things are different. You have to embrace these desirable difficulties and you have to have confidence that it will pay off in the long run, inshallah. Just don't be hasty. Thirdly, learning Arabic vocabulary through English translations. Now, how many people do this? Put your hand up. Yes. And as a matter of fact, even my students, they do it because I give them Quizlet flashcards with Arabic on one side and English on the other side. And this is not because I don't understand that this is a mistake. It's because that working on the alternative takes time. And alhamdulillah, I'm happy now that I... I'm there, alhamdulillah. Right now, I've got the resources for you guys and for them such that you can avoid learning Arabic vocabulary through English translations. Okay? What are these resources? Basically, they are... Um, so you understand the problem. The problem is that when you learn Arabic vocabulary through English translations, you basically just made the loop longer. So instead of having an idea in your mind, like you're thinking of an apple and then coming up with the Arabic word tufah or tufaha. Instead, you're going from idea to English to Arabic. Now that's a longer path in your brain, which means is is, is much is much more difficult for you to become fluent if you're gonna try and speak Arabic by thinking through English. So what's the solution? Solution is that you learn Arabic vocabulary. Not through English, but rather through word relations. Okay? And I actually had the notes here, I thought. I don't know where they where it went. But you learn it through word relations, such as singular to plural. So I give you, I prompt you with a singular word. I say to you, for example, kitab, and then you think of kutub. Or vice versa. Or for example, I give you a word and I tell you, give me its opposite. Or for example, I give you a word, a verb, I tell you, give me the verbal noun. Or for example, I give you a word and I say to you, categorize it. Or which word doesn't belong. So I'll give you like five, four words. Book, pen, exercise book, message it. Which word doesn't belong. Now you are literally processing every single word, thinking of the relations, and then you're answering with masjid, and you're practicing vocabulary without a word of English. Of course, books like Al-Arabi, bain Daik, and Medina book, they've got these kind of exercises. However, they are very limited. Why are they limited? I'll tell you why they're limited. And take this as a rule. It's called the limit of print. That's what I call it at least. A textbook will never have the amount of exercises that you need to get a mastery. Never. Why? Because the limit of print. If they were to print a textbook that has enough exercises for you to master everything, then that book would be five volumes. But alhamdulillah, in this day and age, we have technology. We don't need printing and stuff. We can have those exercises from Baini Adek and we can 5x it, 10x it so that you have enough exercises to keep you busy and that's what I've been working on all these years okay to have enough exercises okay so the Baini Adek has these kind of exercises but they're not enough Taib? Um, so that's why we had to resort to this methodology but inshallah from today onwards no more learning Arabic vocabulary through English translations fifthly not resolving sound recognition problems what do I mean by that? The problem is basically that vocabulary words consist of sounds. And if you mishear the sound, you will misunderstand the word. So for example, you have the word I already gave you before, famous one, qalb and kelp. Now the latter qaf is alien to a lot of English speakers because English doesn't have qaf. So what happens is that there's some interference. When I say qalb, you, you're hearing kelp. Okay, when I say, for example, Alim, you're hearing Alim. Maybe you're thinking I'm saying the same thing. No, I'm not. Alim, Alim, Ain, and Alim. Okay, or for example, short and long vowels. This, this what I found to be the biggest problems with English language speakers, which is they don't differentiate between short and long vowels because English doesn't have short long vowels. And what they call long vowels are not long vowels, they're actually diphthongs. Topic for another day. So that's the problem. If you don't resolve these recognition problems, what's going to happen is that 
you're going to miss here words. Okay, and that's going to cause you to mistype them. So we have these sound recognition exercises that we do. Many Dake is full of these exercises. Actually, one of the only um, curriculums that I know of that actually pay attention to this sound recognition. Most other curriculums don't have this. Okay, so the student hears Alim and he has to type it. You find a lot of students, what do they type? Alim. Some they type Alim with no yeah, and so on and so forth. So you have to practice this sound recognition. It's basically practicing your hearing, right? So what's the solution? You use something called minimal pairs. A minimal pair is like I've mentioned, alim or alim, haram, haram, qalb, kalb. They're basically two words that are exactly the same, the only difference being one phoneme, one sound. Qaf instead of kaf. So you use these kind of minimal pairs to develop the skill, to differentiate and to compare between the two so that if you hear qalb and kalb enough times next to each other, then you finally figure out what the difference is between the two. I mean, your brain will finally figure it out. Finally, uh, second finally, <laughs> second last point, which is uh, drawn out or disjointed grammar explanations. This is a big one. This is a big one. And there's a clip by Sheikh <coughs> Sulaiman Al-Uyuni. I don't know if you guys know him. He's one of the experts really this day and age. Um, when it comes to learning Arabic and teaching Arabic, he's really, really, really good at al Barak. And uh, he's got some books called Sarf al-Saghir and Nahu al-Saghir which you're going to study inshallah ta'ala soon. And he's got this clip that I want you to watch at your own time. It's not translated but maybe I'll translate it inshallah ta'ala uh, soon. Where he talks about this problem which is what we call drawn out or disjointed grammar explanations. Okay? And to give you the gist of it basically the problem is that to understand grammar you have to get the bigger picture. Why? Because grammar is a system that is connected. All these different concepts are connected to each other. Now, if you learn grammar over a long period of time, like for example, once a week lecture, twice a week lecture, and you go over a book over a course of six, seven, eight, nine months, or if you learn it in an unstructured manner, such as notoriously Benny Dick is known for, I know Benny Dick, I love that series. But one of the biggest problems with Benny Dick is the way they approach grammar, especially in book 3 and 4. Their grammar concepts are completely all over the place. There's absolutely no structure to it. <laughs> um, which has forced me to kind of like create a some kind of structure for my students. It took a lot of time. So if you learn a grammar that way, by doing a different concept every week without establishing the connections, you will never be able to understand grammar. Because your brain can't make the connections. So what happens is, instead of understanding the system, okay, and everything falling in place, you end up memorizing a list of rules which you quickly forget. So if you ever thought to yourself, wow, this grammar is too many rules, then you've been taught it wrong. Because grammar is not about rules, it's about an understanding of how the language works. To the extent that every rule kind of makes sense. To the extent that even if you didn't know that rule, you could have guessed it. Wallahi, that's how easy it is. <laughs> if you approach it that way. So you should never learn grammar over a course a long period of time. Here the Sheikh actually advocates, he says, and this is what he does himself, he teaches grammar over the course of three days. Ala marhalat al-fahm, he says, the level of understanding, not the level of mastery. No one's saying to you, you're a master grammar in three days. No, but you can understand grammar in three days. And then it's up to you to practice and make sure that it goes from, like we said, explicit declarative knowledge to implicit procedural knowledge, uh, memory. That's for you now to practice and develop those pathways in your brain and make sure that it turns into a skill. So what's the solution? Solution is try to understand the core grammar skills in a short period of time. And I say go core grammar skills because we talked about the 80-20 principle, which is that you don't need to learn all of it. Just learn the core. And also don't learn the exceptions. Learn the rules. Do all of that in a short period of time. Then practice what you've learned, okay, whilst constantly connecting it back to the bigger picture. You do that, and you'll get rid of, the way she, the Sheikh says, you'll get rid of Mushkilat al nahw the problem that people have with Nahaw. The Final one, which is learning the exceptions before mastering the rule. We already talked about that. Now, almost every rule has an exception. But as a matter of fact, we can say every rule has an exception, actually. Or even it's say almost. We can categorically, categorically say that every single rule in life has an exception, including this one. Who understands that? 
every rule has an exception, including this one. In other words, even this rule has exceptions. In other words, there are rules that don't have an exception. <laughs> so just Tawheed, worshipping Allah alone. There's no exception to that rule. Okay? So every rule has an exception, including this one, which means there are some rules that don't have an exception. But the point is, every rule has an exception. Um, however, these exceptions, they tend to complicate stuff. And this makes it difficult for beginners to understand and master the rule. So the solution is this, very simple. First, establish the rule. Don't talk about exceptions. Establish the rule. Practice consistently until you master it. And then you introduce the exceptions to the rule. Now the exceptions are going to make sense. Because to understand the rule, it has to be established by way of consistent practice. And this is where a lot of teachers, they go wrong. They give you the rule, but then they say to you, but the exceptions are X, Y, and Z. What's the benefit? La. Give me the rule, at least allow me to understand, internalize, master the rule. And then bukra, the bukra, next week, next month, no problem, you can tell me the exceptions. <laughs> I don't need to pop my bubble that quickly. Sah? Right. These are the seven common mistakes. Now we're going to bring everything together and talk about the strategy. It's not going to be that long, inshallah. And then we're going to close the lecture. And I'm going to make the big reveal that I promised you that I would reveal, inshallah. I have no Wuklap question. I'm going to ask Wuklap, but no Wuklap question this time. Um, actually, I will ask a Wuklap question, but I'm not going to show it on the screen. You answer it, inshallah ta'ala, at your own time, which is which of these mistakes are the worst for you? I need, I need to drink some water. Yalla, I'll answer that question of Wuklap while I. Drink some water and have a little break. Bismillah. I'll share the screen. I knew I couldn't do it in an hour and a half. Let alone an hour. <laughs> but khair, inshallah. But almost there. Please be patient with me. Barakallah fiku. Allah yafadkum jami'an. So what are the... What, which of these mistakes are the worst for you? Learning grammar in a disconnected way. <coughs> <coughs> Learning Arabic words by English translation. Isolating grammar rules. <laughs> Focusing too much on grammar. I think most of you, yeah, are struggling with the grammar. Eh? Yalla, continue answering, inshallah. Barakallah fikum. Allah yafadkum. Taib. Naam. Continue answering, inshallah, and we'll benefit from your feedback. Taib. Now let's bring all of it together. Okay. Consider this to be a quick revision of what we've done so far. So how do you actually implement and put into practice what we've covered today? And sure, I'm sure it keeps on popping up. <laughs> the strategy. Now, the strategy is of two parts. We have part number one, how to acquire Arabic vocabulary efficiently. Part number two, how to master grammar skills effortlessly. Okay, so efficiently when it comes to vocab, as in, don't spend more time and more effort than you actually need. Effortlessly, I say that because grammar skills tend to be difficult. People perceive them to be difficult. So I want you to know how to actually learn it without it being difficult. Right, when it comes to vocab, I'll share with you these points. Number one, focus on the 20% of words that make up 80% of what you read or hear. That's takeaway number one. Right, takeaway number two. Space out your vocabulary revision by using tools that have built in space repetition algorithms. Like I said, I'll give you my recommendations. And there's because there's no other way to keep track of the forgetting curve without these tools. Okay? This tool I'm using right now is one of them. Uh, but inshallah, once you join the community, I'm going to give you some options with the strength of each tool. And the weaknesses. And then you can choose whichever one you like, inshallah. And then also I'll give you the actual... Words for Bain Yadik, I haven't done Medina books yet, but I'll give you the actual words for Bain Yadik so that you can just upload them and start practicing, inshallah. Thirdly, practice your sound recognition skills to avoid interference between foreign phonemes, foreign sounds that are foreign to you, and phonemes present in your mother tongue. So basically the Arabic sounds, they interfere with the sounds of your mother tongue. So your mother tongue, if you're an English speaker, for example, kaf, k. But then you hear something like Qaf. 
they're too close to each other. Or Ain and A, Ain and Hamza, like A and A. So there's interference. How do you get rid of the interference? By practicing with minimal pairs. Fourthly, learn vocabulary in Arabic by prompting yourself with word associations instead of English translations. So like we said, opposite words, singular to plural and vice versa, semantic categorization, like which category does word belong in in terms of meaning, or even conjugation as well, like going from verb to verbal noun, which is fi'il to masdar, and, and back and forth. And finally, utilize the Arabic root system to multiply your vocabulary bank easily. I was going to add this to the principles, but because I said four principles, I left it out. Uh, but it could be added to principles. It could also be added as one of the mistakes that people make, which is that they learn the Arabic words separately, even though they are connected to the same root. It would be much better to learn them together. So if you learn the verb jama'a, then along with it, learn the word, the word jami'a, because they're connected. If you learn the word akala, they learn with it akal, which is eating. Because in, in English, it's to eat and eating. Sah? But in Arabic, the mustar doesn't always follow a specific way. It's sometimes going to be different. Like it's akala, aklan. Daraba, darban. That's fine. But it doesn't, it doesn't stay that way. Okay, so for example, you have fa'ala, uh, fi'lan. Uh, so it's not fa'lan. Okay, like darban. And so on and so forth. So the actual harakat, they change. The only way you'll remember them because the scholars they mention it's qiyasi, it's not sama'i. It's sama'i, not qiyasi, sorry. You have to memorize them. Okay? Uh, so the best time to memorize them is not as a separate word altogether, like most of the curriculums they do. They teach you the verb here, and then the verbal noun comes in a completely different unit. La learn them together at the same time. That's much better. Okay? Um, and that's what we've done for you. We've gathered them together. Okay? Um, then we have... Why can I hear Iqam or something? Someone here is in Saudi. Tell me please why I can hear <laughs> someone speaking in the Masjid doing Iqam. It's 1040. Is it Kusuf? Khusuf? Please let me know. <laughs> That's when it comes to vocabulary uh, acquisition. Okay. How about mastering grammar effortlessly? effortlessly? Okay. Number one. Focus on the 20% of rules that will give you or that you'll come across in 80% of sentences. Again, I've got my opinion. I've got a 20% for you. You can go with that. Or, <laughs> good luck finding a 20% by yourself. Um, or maybe if you find it elsewhere, whatever it may be, focus on those 20%. Secondly, learn the core Arabic grammar concepts in a short period of time in order to understand the underlying system. Also, instead of rereading re -reading the grammar explanations, I think you should spend more time doing deliberate practice. Rereading is not rereading is not that useful. It's more about actual active learning, more about active recall. It's more about retrieval and uh, getting the skill. Also, interleave your grammar practice by mixing it up, mixing up the problems you're solving. Okay, so um, even though it affects your short-term performance, as in it'll become much more difficult, right? Um, this is what you should do for the sake of what? Long-term learning. Also, make sure that you practice grammar with sentences that have words that are aligned with your vocabulary bank. Because that way, if you make a mistake, you know that the mistake is because you didn't understand the grammar concept. Not because you don't understand what the word means. Also, make sure that you avoid, avoid rote memorization when practicing grammar. Okay, so don't like memorize the sentence. Rather, understand the concept. And you do this by using adaptive question bank. Adaptive question bank is basically a question bank that where all of the... Sent, there are different sentences that have the same sent, uh, grammar structure. Like, for example, شَرِبَ Muhammadun Haliban, ضَرَبَ Muhammadun Amra. This is the same grammar structure, which is فِعِلْ فَعَلْ مُفْعُلْ بِهِ Right? Use those sentences where the vocabulary is different, but the grammar structure is the same so these adaptive question banks what they do is you they tag the sentence or the question according to the grammar concepts that are present within it so then it kind of mixes up number one all of the questions 
such that you interleave and you practice different things. But when you get a question right, it's not going to say that, oh, Muhammad got the sentence right, which is the sentence that says, Daraba Zaydun Amra. No. It's going to say, oh, Muhammad got this grammar structure right. He knows how to find the fa'il. He knows how to find the fa'il. And then based on that, the system actually uh, gives you less of that grammar concept, the better you get at it. So it's called adaptive question bank. There are some tools that use it um, in an easy way. And there are some that use AI. And that's the one I had the certificate on. Uh, one of the companies, they have a, a system whereby they use artificial intelligence to uh, take care of these sort of things, to deliver these adaptive questions. Topic for another day. But um, that, that's basically where we are with technology, alhamdulillah. So that's how you should practice grammar. Also, do not worry about exceptions until you establish the rule. And finally, and this is a question, yes, which is, and then this doesn't apply, this this doesn't, uh, this final point is not part of the strategy, but I know there's a question in your mind. You're thinking to yourself, but Ustad, hold on. Where do I start? I don't have the skills or resources to implement this strategy. What are you talking about, Ustaz? Find the 20% of words and use an adaptive question bank and come on, Ustaz. Huh? I thought you were going to give me a strategy that I can actually implement. Huh? Which of you think, which of you, uh, how many of you guys are thinking like that? Huh? I can't read your mind. But I can imagine that this question has come to, has come to you. So let me give you the answer to that question. And this is basically where we reveal the big surprise. Bismillah. The big surprise is Barakallahu feekum That today's free training session That you attended It is part of a bigger program Which you've come across The Arabic Accelerator program But a lot of you didn't know what it meant Some of you asked me Ustad, what is this? Is it only one session? What is this meant to mean? No, no, no This is part of a bigger program Okay And today was the first session Okay But this is going to be followed By two things Number one the Vocabulary Accelerator Challenge. And number two, the Grammar Accelerator Challenge. Okay? I'll talk about both in a moment. These are two challenges that you're going to take part in, inshallah. And within these challenges, I'm going to give you all the resources that you need according to everything I've talked about today, inshallah. And, or at least most of the things that we can implement at this stage. We might not be able, I mean, I have to be honest. Full disclaimer. This is all theory. We're trying to implement this in everything that we give you, but some things are more difficult to implement than others. So whatever we managed to implement it, we've implemented it. You'll find out exactly where. And whatever we haven't managed to implement yet, then it's on our roadmap, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can eventually come up with a system or a program or a strategy that is for you, plug and play. Okay? Uh, so this is what the two accelerated challenges are about. Now, I'll tell you how long they're going to last But the purpose behind these challenges Barakallahu feekum Is number one It's not to say that after the challenge You're gonna master grammar MashaAllah You've covered all of Arabic grammar Or you've learned a thousand words La That's not what the challenge is about The challenge is about If we go back to what we mentioned earlier Go back to Sheikh Abdul Salam Shwayr's clip What did that clip say? He said If you wanna make it You need two things You need to know the path and you need to be consistent. That's what the challenge is about. It's about practically showing you everything that I've presented today, how to implement it, give you the resources to implement it, number one. And number two, for you to do it consistently for 21 days. So the vocabulary challenge is about 10 days and the grammar is 14 days. All in all is about 24 days. I want you to get into the habit of doing these things so that by the end of the challenge, mashallah, tabarakallah, it doesn't matter who you're studying with, yes, you are a transformed person, you have developed good habits when it comes to learning Arabic, you know how to do it, you've practiced how to do it, you went through the ups and the downs, and mashallah, this is now, we've achieved our goal, which is I have hopefully accelerated your progress towards Arabic mastery. So that's basically what it's about, accelerating your progress. 
I'm not going to guarantee that you'll get to the end of the destination at the end of this challenge. La, that's impossible. But, inshallah, it will accelerate your progress towards your goal of mastering the Arabic language. And then it's going to be followed by a closing session on how to develop Arabic language skills with ease. Um, we're going to host, it's going to be me and Dr. Awad as well, if you, if you guys know him. He's a lecturer at King Saud University. He's one of the trainers at Al Arabiya Bayni Adayk. He's the one that did the Arabic for All training that I've done, where they train teachers. He was the actual instructor for that. A well known, world renowned expert when it comes to teaching Arabic to non natives. He travels all around the world. He will join us, inshallah, in that session. And that is specifically on how to develop Arabic language skills with ease. Uh, it's kind of like a follow on of today's. Um, Session today's session is a lot of theory. That session is a bit more practice, inshallah. And then finally, we're gonna have the upskill Arabic alpha launch. Now, what is upskill Arabic? I'm sure some of you have seen it on the WhatsApp. You're thinking, what is this thing? Now, upskill Arabic is something extremely exciting, inshallah, which I'll talk about at the end, because again, uh, times of the essence. I'm just gonna quickly gonna show you the vocabulary and grammar accelerator. What's involved? What the next steps are? And then at the end, inshallah, we'll just talk about upskill Arabic uh, in, in a concise way. So the vocabulary challenge, barakallah fikum, it's going to last for 10 days. It will start on Monday, inshallah. Everything goes according to plan. And it will finish on Wednesday, the 8th of November. Okay? Give or take one or two days. Right? We might start one day late or whatever. I'll try to start on Monday. If not, we'll start on Tuesday. But this is basically the plan. And... Uh, is, uh, four different levels We have total beginners Okay Total beginners They're going to practice the core Remember we talked about Learning the 80-20 principle um, I'm going to give them the core Of the ABY Arabi Ben Yedek Vocabulary In total 200 words And their challenge is to master Those 200 words uh, Those of you that have done Ben Yedek before Are doing Ben Yedek level 1 Then you're going to be doing One unit per day Okay 25 words um, and you're also going to add some word relations to that Like learning the opposites of each word The category of each word, how to say it in Arabic And their plurals as well So this 200 words will be expanded a bit more Okay And then we have levels 1 to do, 2 to two. You're going to be doing 550 words a day 400 in total That's if you've done Bani Dek, level book 1 and 2 And then those of you that have done level 3, 4 or more than that then you're going to learn all of the words in Bain Yedek, level 1 and 2. It's about 600 words actually. There are 400 core words and another 200 supplemental words or that are not part of the core that we've chosen. Uh, but really the importance here is you might say that, you know what, Ustad, I've done level 1 and 2 with you before. I'm fairly confident with the, with the vocabulary that I've learned in those two books. No, there's actually a bit more than that. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to expand that vocabulary bank. Okay, that's how it should have been done from the beginning actually Qadar Allah Which is, you're going to learn all of the different word relations With that word So you're going to learn its hyponym It basically is the category that it belongs to So if you learn tufah, you also learn faqih along with it Okay, and you got uh, other words that are related to it as well Then you have antonyms, the opposites of the word Then you have the plurals What's the plural of kitab, kutub then you have the verbal nouns for the verbs. So if you learn the verb, for example, akala, also learn aklan. If you learn the ver word ta'allama, then you should also know that the verbal noun is ta'liman, the masdar. The root verbs as well. So if you have a noun, what is the root verb for that noun? And also how to go from past tense to present tense, because that's not always fixed. Okay, so you have daraba yadribu. Do you have akala ya'kulu? Okay. Shariba yashrabu. So the haraka for the present tense sometimes changes. So knowing exactly how it goes from past tense to present tense, you should know. And then command tense, this is something that it's a grammar skill. That's not something you memorize. These are the things that you actually memorize, the road memorization that you need to repeat. Now, the benefit of this uh, challenge is that when we start the grammar challenge, you have a solid vocabulary bank. That's one of the things that we mentioned earlier, which is before you learn grammar, make sure you have some vocab. And then all of the grammar exercises are going to be based on that vocabulary. So it reinforces the vocab that you've learned. And also it makes sure that if you make a mistake in the grammar practice, it's because you didn't understand the actual word. Sorry, it's because you didn't understand the concept as opposed to 
uh, not understanding what the word means because you should know what the word means because you've already done your vocabulary. The schedule is as follows. So I didn't add the topics yet, but uh, for whatever level you're on, day one will be unit one, day two will be unit two. If you're doing two units, it's going to be unit one and two and so on and so forth, okay? Then we have one day in break in the middle. That's just to catch up and, and revise. Then another four days and then revision. So in total, it's 10 days. Two days of revision, four days of actual learning. Um, what are the daily activities, Ustad? How am I actually going to do these vocabulary words? Now, it's this is the ideal situation. If you're a bit tight on time, then we might strip it down for you a little bit. But first, you learn a new daily batch. Every day, we're going to have a new batch that you're going to practice. So you're going to have a flashcard widget for today's new words just to warm up. And then when you're done, you're going to practice on a tool called WooFlash that has spaced repetition and this to get you ready for assignment. The assignment, and this is the challenge, the assignment, you're not going to write English and Arabic. La. You are going to type the Arabic word. So you better get your Arabic keyboards ready. So you're going to get whatever prompt you're going to get to remember the word, you're going to type it up. You can type it with harakat or without harakat. Okay? That's the assignment. Uh, it's going to be X number of words to test you, you submit that and then it gets marked as well. If you make mistakes, spelling mistakes and stuff, you'll get it back marked. And then finally, you're going to do a quiz. Okay? You're going to submit a daily quiz. So these are basically what you're doing for every batch. Okay? And we're going to try and do a daily review session. Okay? It's like a 30-minute review session every day of the challenge. A live session with myself. We focus on the words that are released in the last 20 hours. I go over some of the common mistakes. I answer your questions. I reveal today's leaderboard winners. Yes, we're going to have that as well. I'm going to make sure that the whole program is very competitive. We'll do a live competition online as well. And then I'm going to reveal the new words for tomorrow. And then you're going to have 24 hours to do the quiz. Okay, that I talked about earlier. Okay, after the review session. Uh, we're going to have a daily leaderboard as well. And we're also going to have daily quiz. These two, obviously, I've already mentioned them on the daily batch. Um, type So that's basically daily activities But inshallah by the end of the 10 days Whatever vocabulary words you're meant to learn You would have absolutely Mastered them inshallah By the will of Allah How much time do you need? I would say at most you need 2 hours Depends on how quickly or fast you learn or how slow But I would say depending on the level you're on Is roughly about an hour to 2 hours a day Okay Then we have the grammar uh, Accelerated challenge this one is slightly different because uh, we're doing, in terms of schedule, we're doing live lecture one day and then one day for assignments. And then live lecture one day for assignments. That's why it's double the length. Because we're not just doing explanation every day. So I'm going to explain the grammar concept and then you can do assignments. So inshallah, we're going to cover the core grammar skills in, our, in about 14 days. Like we said, you should do this as quickly as possible. I'll try and make sure that it is uh, connected. And some of the benefits, the purpose of it is to fill any existing gaps that you have in your grammar skills and to provide each student with a better understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. That's the purpose of the program. Um, different levels, of course. It depends on level you're on. It could be that you've done Bainedeg level one. It could be you've done level one and two. It could be you've done level three and four. Whichever one you're on, you're going to find one that is at your level. So if you've done level book level book one of Bainedeg before, then this is a good revision. Same thing if you've done level two and so on and so forth. And it's, the program is solely focused on what? Practice and implementation what we've learned With minimum time spent on theory explanation So literally theory explanation is to the point And then in the live session We spend 80% of the time Practice, practice, practice Until I'm sure that you understood And then I tell you to go and do the assignments Inshallah ta'ala And get ready for next lecture We'll have about 3 or 4 lectures per week uh, And after the lecture You'll have the opportunity to improve your skills Cover during the lecture at your own pace By doing the exercise on the portal uh, Type at the end of the program, you'll walk away with a complete mastery of the core grammar skills. Not all grammar skills, but the core grammar skills, especially those that are related to uh, Baini Adek. Okay? Maybe in the future, we'll cater for other curriculums. But right now, it doesn't matter what curriculum you've learned before. Everybody can do this. But it's a bit catered more towards Baini Adek. So we're doing Baini Adek vocabulary, Baini Adek grammar concepts. Okay? Which, again, is a big overlap with other curriculums. But this is what we're focusing on. Taib, uh, that's the grammar challenge. Taib, I'm done with this. I'm going to do a quick closing, tell you what the next steps are, and then we'll come back and talk about upskill Arabic, inshallah. Um, now, 
question I want to ask you before I go to the closing is all of these challenges, the vocabulary challenge, the grammar challenge, and all the resources that you're going to get and everything that I have presented so far, okay, and we're coming to the end of it. My question to you is, I'm going to ask this on WooClub. So how, how much do you think I'm going to charge you for that? No, no, groups and everything are separate. I'll talk about the WhatsApp groups and these sort of things in a moment, but everything is segregated. Barakallah Fiku. One K, five million. <laughs> Dua. <laughs> Nothing, inshallah. Very expensive. Oh, mm, quite a lot. <laughs> rewards in Jannah. I can't charge you rewards in Jannah. That is from Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For ikhlas And uh, now Allah The answer to that My dear brothers and sisters Allah Yahfadhkum jami'an Is that I'm charging you nothing It's completely free Okay It's completely free uh, Benefit from it Barakallahu feek uh, Share it with others Make sure they benefit as well huh? All of this Allah Yahfadhkum is, is part of the bigger vision and goal. When I say to you that my vision, my goal is to make sure that everybody learns Arabic to aid the Ummah, I see it like the way I teach my tafsir classes and everything. I mean it. May Allah give us ikhlas. But I mean it. Right? I want you to benefit. Okay? I want you to benefit. I want you to learn Arabic. I want Arabic learning to be accessible to as many people as possible. And this even applies to those of you that maybe are teaching Arabic. Sah? If you need these resources, you want to benefit from it, you want to help in the spread of it, tafaddal, contact me, inshallah. Uh, let's do this. Let's 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 have a language shift. Allah yahfadhkum jami'an. You know? Um, so, barakallahu feekum. This, I am not charging you anything for this. Right? If you take this challenge from beginning until end, and you turn up every single day, and you do every single assignment, and it's marked for you, and you walk out at the end of the program having developed these habits and it changes the way you learn Arabic and it saves you a lot of time and money that you spend on other courses. I don't want anything from you in return. Taib? All right? All I'm saying to you is pay it forward. That skill that you gain, that what you've learned, give it to someone else. Right? Let's aid the ummah. Let's Spread the Arabic language. Let's cut the road for these cowboys and these highway robbers, yes, who get in between the Muslims and the scholars. Right? Now that doesn't mean, Allah Yafalkum, that it's free for us. Now there's a lot of cost involved, involved for us. Our team is, I think about eight people we got in the team right now, two volunteers and six people that get wages. There's a lot of cost and, 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 and sacrifice involved um, there's an Arabic cohort that I was meant to teach by now Which I've postponed by another three weeks And You know So it's not free for us But I don't want anyone to miss out on this opportunity Because they can't afford it But those of you that do want to support I welcome that Ahlan wa sahlan, There are ways for you to contribute Now uh, not just money wise You can contribute uh, Barakallah fikum By PayPal or whatever Or you can be a Patreon May Allah ta'ala reward all of those And Wallahi, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I wouldn't have been here today where I am and being I wouldn't have been able to present all of this to you if it wasn't for the generous Patreon supporters or those that have supported me in previous endeavors. Jazawumullah uh, khairan. I ask Allah that they get their full share of the reward. So don't think right now I come to you, uh, Muhammad Abdul has done all of this and he's the superhero. La wallah. La wallah. There's people that are sweating as much as I am in the background. Some that have been volunteering for, for years. There are some that have been supporting me on Patreon for months, for, for years, sorry. Yes? And inshallah, all of them will have a share in the reward. You can join in that reward, la best. I welcome that. 
But even if you can't, you can support by number one, support subscribing to the channel, liking the video, commenting on it, hitting notification bell, because this makes sure that more people get access to it. You know, you know what YouTube does. YouTube, they see engagement, they're gonna put in everybody's feed. Instead of having a feed of some kind of deviant, they're gonna see this kind of beneficial course. Also, what you can do is you can share it with others. Uh, you can contribute to the cost, like I said, and I'll post these links on on YouTube for those of you that want. Um, absolutely don't think that when I'm posting this, uh, it's, a, it's a must. Like I said, if you don't pay me a penny, yes, but you benefit, alhamdulillah, I'm happy. Okay? Or also another way that you can support us by, I mean, volunteering. I wouldn't say volunteering because we had bad experience with volunteers. Uh, not all of them, but with some volunteers before. So I don't know about volunteering, but we're even looking to hire. If you have specific skills like you know how to edit videos, social media, management, there are certain things that we are not able really to do because of lack of resources. We're even willing to hire, depending on the support that we get. So feel free to uh, email us at admin at binabdurrahi.com for that as well, inshallah ta'ala. Now those, that's how you can support it. Okay, like I said, don't have to pay a penny. Uh, Barakallahu feekum. Uh, but uh, that's how you can support if you want to. And next, we're going to talk about the steps. What are the next steps? You're ready. You're pumped up. You want to uh, uh, start this journey. Allah yahfadak. Welcome. What do you do? Right, let's talk about that, inshallah. Uh, where is the screen again? There we go. Time. Just one second. Okay. Now the first thing you do is register if you haven't done so already. That's number one. And I, uh, the moderators, if they can repost the link at regular intervals or the other links for support as well. I don't even know how to pin a, how do I pin a message from myself? Uh, if you haven't registered already, then please register. Okay, yeah, pin message. I'm trying to pin my message. Okay, anyway, I'll pin it in a moment. Type, uh, if you haven't registered, register. Then what you need to do is join the WhatsApp community. Okay, why? Because that's where we're going to post everything. Um, so you have to be in that community. If you're joining us just now on YouTube, you're watching the replay, I'll post the link as well, inshallah ta'ala, uh, later on in the description or whatever. Um, let, let me get the link. I mean, if the moderators can help with that, it would be appreciated. <laughs> um, now, the community, by the way, is actually limited to 2,000 people. And we're already way over 1,000. So, the sooner you join the community, the better. Okay? Um, the sooner you join, the better. Uh, because if the community is full, I'm not sure if I'm going to actually open another community because of the challenges of managing so many different communities. So now is the time to join. Also, join the WhatsApp channel because the community, um, the way WhatsApp works, you can't really see previous messages. So at least if you want to see what you missed, then you'll catch that on the WhatsApp channel. There's the link to that. Barakallahu feekum. I've given you four links so far. Uh, two links to support, two links to join the community. Sorry, five links and one link to register if you haven't done so already. Then you fill out the registration form. Now the registration form, Allah, I wish it was ready. I wish it was ready, but I was just so busy with final, getting the outline of this ready and everything. I didn't manage to finish, finalize the registration form. But I'll finalize it, inshallah, and I'll post it on the community. I was really hoping to, to send it now. Registration form for the Arabic Accelerator Program. The vocabulary challenge and the grammar challenge. Why? Because we are going to have segregated groups on WhatsApp for brothers and sisters. And we're gonna, even going to uh, segregate it as well according to <coughs> time zones. So people are not bothered. It's like someone in America who just woke up sending a message while people in Asia are asleep. So we're going to have like a group for Asia, a group for Middle East, a group for Africa and Europe, and a group for Americas. So those are like four different time zones. So the way you receive the link to the group that you belong to is through the registration forms. I'm going to ask you like the country you live in, your gender, your name, and a few other things. And then you're going to get the link to join the channel. Also, 
at the end of it, you'll get a link that is specific to you. You use that link to share with others. If you use that link to share with others, then we will know of that, and that will help towards getting amazing prizes. So I'm not even done yet, by the way. <laughs> I'm not even done yet. All of you get free access to the vocabulary challenge and the grammar challenge. However, a, 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 a very group of you, a very large group of you guys will also get access, free access to very valuable things that actually I charge money for. I'm going to give it to you for free, but I'll tell you how to get it in a moment. But to start with, do these things. And then finally, once you finish the registration form, you join the segregated groups. So what are the prices? Because I remember I told you about a daily leaderboard and I told you about the competitions and everything. So we have a lot of things in place to make sure that people are engaged. Because at the end of the day, you will not gain benefits from this program if you're not engaged. Okay? The only way you'll gain benefit is if you're engaged. So we're trying to, like I said, Get consistency. We need to motivate you. I know you need you need carrot and a stick. No stick, I promise. But we do have a lot of carrots. One of the carrots that we have is number one. All of you, anyone who finishes the vocabulary challenges, the vocabulary and the grammar one, makes it to the end. Yes, you stick around and you do your assignments. You will get free access. Listen carefully. Lifetime access to Upskill Arabic self-paced subscription. So Upskill Arabic, I haven't talked about it yet. It is um, basically something we're working on with all of the resources to make sure people, they learn Arabic. It's going to be something that's very affordable, but it can't be free, of course, because like I said, uh, things that are free are not sustainable, right? We don't have government backing. Uh, we I'm not keen of asking people for help. And whatever. So it's going to be very affordable. And we'll have ways for people to get free subscriptions and stuff as well. And it's not even something anytime soon. It's going to be launched maybe two months from now, three months from now. But those of you that make it through the challenge, I promise you, you will get free lifetime access to the self paced subscription, which means you'll get all of the flashcards, all of the explanation videos, all the exercises, everything you can think of that Upskill Arabic will offer, which I'll talk about in a moment. You'll get it for free. Now, just right now, the cohorts that I teach, the self-paced program, costs £97 per level. So that itself is like almost £1,000 that you got completely for free. All you need to do is make it through the challenge. Now, I'm serious, okay? If you don't, don't miss the opportunity. That's one thing. Now, those of you that actually win the competition, so we're going to have these competitions and a select number of you guys who really stand out, you will get access to premium subscription, which basically means that you get to join the live cohorts for free. Basically, it's basically a lifetime, lifetime scholarship until you learn Arabic, basically. <laughs> we'll, we'll be there with you. We'll give you everything you need to learn Arabic up until you learn it. But you have to prove yourself. You have to prove that you're serious. How do you prove that you're serious? In one of three ways. Okay, by either getting very high grades Absolutely killing it, mashallah, tabarakallah. Or by being very, very engaged. Very, very engaged. As in, mashallah, on, on the community, in the challenge, you do all your assignments and you're just very engaged, mashallah. Or by being a big supporter who shares the links or whatever. I'm not even going to say, you don't even need to contribute financially. If you support the cause, which is spreading the Arabic language by sharing it, by whatever, you know, being engaged on social media platforms so that the algorithms, they help, whatever. I call them amb ambassadors. Being an ambassador of the program, right? We're going to pick people based on these three criteria, inshallah. Certain number from each criteria. So that is, again, a major carrot for you to work hard and make the most of this challenge. This is not the f last time we're going to do the challenge. We'll do the challenge again sometime in the future, inshallah. If you can't do it right now, like this. Maybe you'll join in the future. But I don't think I'm going to offer this kind of carrot in the future. Now is the time. Barakallahu feek. Okay. So that's that's it. Now we're going to talk about upskill Arabic for those of you that want to hang around. La best. But really, that's the end of it. Again, to repeat, uh, support the initiative. Subscribe, like, comment, share with others. Contribute if you like. Uh, or email us if you have specific 
uh, you know, skills uh, so that you can be part of the team. Register if you haven't done so already. Join the community and the channel too while you're at it. Fill out the registration form. Of course, the community, you'll get the link. I've sent the link already on YouTube, but you'll get it if you register as well. Fill out the registration form when I post it tomorrow. Join the private segregated groups and then enjoy your journey. Okay. Now, before I talk about upskill Arabic, which is not going to be that long, but some of you might not want to hang around. I just want to have your feedback. Barakallah Fiku. Your thoughts or suggestions on WooClub? Someone said community link doesn't work. It'll be posted again. It'll be posted if you've registered as well. Um, but nah, here. So someone can repost it as well on YouTube, Arkalafik. Please do that. Um we'll talk about upskill Arabic in a moment. Upskill Arabic is basically what I've been working on for the past 10 years. I just want to bring everything together. But I'm going to tell you why I started Upskill Arabic or how the idea came about, what it is about, and what the plans are for it, inshallah, uh, in a moment. I loved how we went through a journey instead of getting straight to the strategy. Help me appreciate the strategy more. Alhamdulillah. I like that. Jazakallah khair. So someone said, if we stick through the course, it's free. And if it's not, it costs money. Yes. So the upskill Arabic, it can't be free. It's not going to be free for everyone because otherwise there's no way to sustain it. Uh, but those of you that are fortunate enough to be part of this challenge, if you stick through the challenge, right? I'll tell you what it means to stick through it. I'll set certain criteria. You stick through it, then you'll get upskill Arabic, free subscription, to the self-paced, self-paced area, forever, or whatever that tier ends up being called. But that's the tier where that doesn't include cohort classes and stuff. And some of you will also get access to the actual classes, live classes with workshops and everything uh, if you are some of the most engaged, uh, highest performing student. Type okay, let's talk about upskill Arabic. Allah yahfadkum jami'an. May Allah Ta'ala accept from us all. Zakallah khair. Um, so, upskill Arabic. Type. Bismillah. Type. Upskill Arabic. Alpha launch. That's basically what we're going to have, inshallah, after the accelerator is done. What is Upskill Arabic? Upskill Arabic is basically a platform where you're going to have everything that you need in order to maximize and in order to learn Arabic effectively. So we're talking flashcards, exercises, daily workshops, everything you need, right? And the way it works is that it doesn't matter who you're studying with. You don't need to be studying with me. You can study with whoever you like. You can be studying at the university. You can be studying, um, you know, with a, your local ustad. It doesn't matter. On Upskill Arabic, you'll find everything that you need according to the curriculum you're studying. Because that's another thing with Upskill Arabic, which is we're looking to cater for all the different curriculums. If you're doing Baini Adek, you're going to find resources for Baini Adek. If you're doing uh, Ben Medina books, you'll find resources for Medina books, and so on and so forth. That's Upskill Arabic, basically. A one-stop place where you find everything that you need. Inshallah. It'll take time to get there, but we ask Allah for tawfiq. Now, why upskill Arabic? That's really the big question I want to answer here. The other questions are easy, but why? Now, first, you have to know where we are now. Where am I now? Right now, I'm teaching, co I just finished teaching cohort four. I've been teaching Arabic right now, online for the past year and a half. We've been doing the Arabic causational course, which is Baini Adek, and I just finished cohort four. I was teaching three levels, level one, two, and four, with more than 50 students. Now, sometime along the way, I was like, wow, I'm getting tired of this. Level 1, I've taught it three times so far. And I was like, this is not sustainable. Numbers of students are increasing. Um, these live classes have got a limit. Muhammad, I'm not going to 
achieve my vision or goal of spreading the Arabic language, you know, with 50 students at a time. Okay, maybe I can if those 50 students all become teachers as well. I'm kind of multiplying myself, but I thought to myself, maybe there's a better way. Okay, um, but nevertheless, I stuck through it, and I'm that doesn't mean I'm going to stop teaching life, by the way. I'm going to continue teaching life forever, inshallah. But when I thought about things, the three main things I offer for my Arabic courses is I offer live lectures where I explain stuff. I give the students assignments and resources based on Bani Adaik. And then uh, those assignments are marked and returned to them. And also we have live workshops. Okay? Where they come and they practice in a small set group of students. And I have other teachers to help me with that as well. But then the question is, which of these three can't be scaled to meet demand? So as demand increases and I want to scale it, I want more people to benefit from it. There's actually one of these things that does not scale, which is limited, which is the live lectures. The live instruction that I do myself, I'm the only person, okay, that does it at the moment. Maybe other people can do it in the future, but at this moment in time, that's the limiting factor, okay? So the solution to that obviously is very simple, which is record the lessons beforehand and employ what's called the flipped classroom model, whereby students, they watch the video at their own time and then they attend for the workshops in order to implement. That's a solution, alhamdulillah. Uh, but really what caught my eye is, and this is alhamdulillah from the ni'mah of Allah and also from the from my students, which is at the end of every cohort, I send out feedback forms. And I gather their feedback to see what to work on, what's best, what's working for them, what's not. Okay, because at the end of the day, my experience of learning Arabic was a very long time ago, and I didn't have most of these resources, but they do. But the only way for me to know if the resources actually work is by getting their feedback, of course. So the, from the feedback that I've got, I found that what the students benefit from the most are two things, which are the workshops and assignments. That's what they benefit from the most. And of course, it makes sense because this is active learning that we talked about today. In workshops, they're actually implementing what they've learned. Assignments, they're implementing what they've learned. Right? So that's when I thought to myself, what can I do? What should I do? Now, alhamdulillah, it's from the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not boasting, but alhamdulillah, Allah has given me an ability to create good learning resources. So alhamdulillah, I've done some courses on instructional design and other courses. Like I said, I've done a certification course as a learning engineer, what they call. So alhamdulillah, that I see as my strength, which is creating learning resources that are engaging and that are good. So I said to myself, you know, Muhammad, there's so many people that are explaining grammar, that are explaining Arabic, that are doing live classes. People have local teachers, some are studying at universities, some of them are watching videos. I said to myself, why am I spending so much time on those things? What, why not make more use of the strengths that Allah has given me? So I said to myself, what should I do? Answer was, I should probably spend most of my effort on creating learning resources and arranging live workshops, since this is what students benefit from the most. Okay? So that's basically how we came to Upskill Arabic. Tayyip, that's the thinking behind it. Which is, put more effort on learning resources and make that available to everyone. That can be scaled, mashallah. So it doesn't matter who you're studying with, you can benefit from these learning resources. And also arranging live workshops, which is kind of like an opportunity for you to implement what you've learned with your teacher locally with a small group of students that are at your level. So alhamdulillah, we've been working on that for a while. As a matter of fact, we spend a lot of money on creating a, a mobile app. Okay, alhamdulillah, there's people that supported, they invested and we a lot of award them. So we put money on creating a, an app that will help with arranging those workshops. And then we have other platforms for the delivering and doing the resources. And that's how we are looking الكريم, to make upskill Arabic work. Now, at this moment, it's going to be an alpha, alpha launch, which is going to be with the most engaged students, like I said, because I'm going to benefit from them a lot. And they're going to benefit the program. Disengaged students, you know, uh, you know, what can I do? You know, they won't benefit as much and they might also, you know, affect the environment. So that's why I'm offering Upskill Arabic. The alpha launch is only for engaged students. And in that launch, we're going to try and release everything that we have so far, arrange the workshops, get the system up and running. Once the system is up and running, then we'll go to a beta launch and then we'll do a public launch, inshallah ta'ala. And then after that, you will make a subscription. 
so that the system can sustain itself and so that more and more people can benefit. So inshallah, the sky is the limit like they say. I'm not worried about that. All I'm worried about is that we get to that level, inshallah, may Allah make it easy. So when is that going to happen? Well, the Alpha launch is about a month from now after the accelerated program. And then it really depends on how long it takes to get the system running and have enough resources. And then we'll do the beta launch and then the public launch. Hopefully before Ramadan, الكريم, it should be available to everyone. But right now, you guys have the opportunity to actually join from the beginning, which, of course, it's going to be free for you. But also, you have the opportunity to actually contribute and help in the success of this project. So that inshallah ta'ala two, three, four, five years from now, if we see major differences in Muslim communities in the West and what have you, you can say, Alhamdulillah, from the name of Allah, I was part of that. You know? Because subhanAllah, I know, for example, Shaykh Falah bin Ismail al-Mundikar, rahmatullah alayhi may Allah have mercy on him. When he used to come to us in Birmingham to do some classes, back in the early 2000s, the Shaykh would come every time when he would come back, he would be like, wait a minute, you guys still don't know Arabic? Then I tell you guys last time that you should learn Arabic so that we can do class in Arabic. Are we still going to translate? He used to say that all the time. And I'm sad to say that 20 years later, we're still at the same situation. Right? Still only a fraction of the people know Arabic. Now again, I know because there's challenges involved. You know, there's a lot of people that know Arabic, but there's not a lot of people who know how to teach Arabic. There are two different things. A lot of people, they think that, oh, he graduated from Jamaat Islamiyah, he learned Arabic, he must be able to teach it. No, that's not the case. So unfortunately, there's a lot of different wrong approaches. These common mistakes that we talked about today, I'm sure all of you have some level of experience regarding that. Uh, not many people implement these principles that we talked about. And even worse, nobody's creating these kind of resources that we're talking about, which give uh, the biggest, um, if you like, uh, effect, the biggest results. So that's inshallah ta'ala when it will happen. Who, like I told you, Anyone that is learning Arabic can benefit from upskill Arabic. Anyone. Doesn't matter who they're studying with. That's alhamdulillah how I hope to spread my efforts to as many people as possible without it being limited to myself. Where, uh, like I said, it's going to be on a dedicated platform, inshallah ta'ala, that is being worked on at the moment. That's upskill Arabic. Uh, it's not yet public knowledge, but you guys first wants to find out. Uh, let me know what you think about that idea, actually. I know some of you posted questions, but I don't think I can answer questions today. So, what do you think? Arabic, and what are your... Uh, do you have any suggestions? I welcome that. Barakallah feekum. You can answer on WooClap. With that, I can conclude, inshallah, if uh, if you can repost all of the links again. Allah yahfadik the links to support, the links to register, the links to the community platform, the channel. I would appreciate that. Barakallah um, fikum. Let me see what you guys say about Upskill Arabic. Bismillah. Then again, I'll, we'll conclude with that anyway. We're done. Barakallah fikum. Muhammad. Please, again, subscribe, like the channel. Engage with the content, hit the bell button, whatever. These things, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it takes nothing, right? It's literally a few clicks and you can help in the spread of the khair. But still not everybody does it, you know? Still not everybody does it. So I need you to do that, inshallah. Not just today, but going forward, whenever we have a live YouTube session or a YouTube video is uploaded, you know, interact with it, inshallah ta'ala, so that at least, you know, people can have a break from all of the misguidances and shubuhat and evil stuff that are being posted on YouTube. Allah Hafadik. So to clarify, does that mean that our classes are over for Baini Dick? No, not at all. That's not what it means at all. What it means is that um, I'm going to continue teaching live, but I'm also making all the resources available for everyone else so that other teachers can benefit from it. Or students who are not studying with us Baini Dick on the Arabic Quotation course can also benefit from it. So instead of, um, if you like, these resources being exclusively for the students on the cohort, I'm looking to make it available to everyone. But then the cohorts will continue with the small numbers uh, that we can cater for, inshallah ta'ala. Okay? Hmm. 
Barakallah feekum. So, yeah, so this idea I had for a long time. <laughs> it was one of the best kept secrets. <laughs> but I'm happy to have shared it with you guys today. Make dua for us, inshallah ta'ala. Support it what you can, whichever way you can support, like we said. And we ask Allah for tawfiq. It's been a very, very challenging, if you like, um, few days for me. I don't even know how we are hitting 11.30. That's two hours and a half. SubhanAllah. Anyway, I never really committed to any time. I think in my, uh, on the website or in the community, because I knew that is going to be a struggle to hit, to, 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 uh, Commit to any specific time frame Honestly those of you that are still here You guys Allahumma barik You guys are soldiers <laughs> Allahumma barik <laughs> you guys, Those that are still here you're soldiers mashallah. That just that shows commitment then and then uh, Keep doing what you're doing Inshallah ta'ala hold on And have sabr you'll make it inshallah You know if you could sit and listen to me For two hours and a half and be bored Out of your nose mashallah, That's some level of commitment mashallah Tabarakallah uh, so yeah, the registration form and everything will be posted on the community, WhatsApp community, inshallah Or it will be posted by email as well If you have registered So again, I can't share the registration form right now, like I said Because it's not just it's not ready yet, 100% But I will share it to anyone who's registered And anyone who's on the community channel So all it takes is to register Registration literally takes half a minute First name, email, that's it That's all it takes So someone can pin the link again I'm sure there's a way to link to pin these links. Where is it? Where's the registration link? You can pin the uh, actual link or whatever so that people have access to it. I'll post it in the description as well for the for the video for those of you that are watching the replay. Marakallah fikum. Um, Alhamdulillah. Where's the registration link? Just register The moment you register as well You get an email With the community link Or the channel link So That's all you need to do That's the link to register How do I pin it? I don't know I think it has to be done on YouTube Allah jamian. Again don't forget to share it huh? Share it with anyone That might benefit Pin message there you go, message pinned Okay Share with everyone um, I'll suffice with that Again, once again Jazakumullah khairan for joining Barakallah feekum And uh, I hope to see all of you In the challenge I see To see all of you benefiting Insha'Allah Three weeks from now, four weeks from now We're going to have some amazing success stories Insha'Allah And we will have finally proved And like I said at the beginning The whole purpose is what? To prove that learning Arabic is not difficult, you guys, inshallah, will prove to the world that that's the case, inshallah. Okay? Hayyakumullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.